So I'll call the meeting to order at six twelve. Before we get started, I just want to add um, under um, board management and governance, item C would be an update from the labor management committee, um, giving us they were going out to get some information and to kind of help us to determine a charge for that group. So they're going to. I believe Krista has some information to share, and then we'll take action at the next meeting to um, officially give them a charge and get them working. But Krista will present some, an update. And everybody wants to see. Okay, um, Shauna was going to be our minute taker, but she's not going to be able to make it. She sent me a message, so we'll just kind of do the best we can. What's in there? Is there any public comment? Okay. Well, we're, done. we're down to the consent agenda with one item, the minutes <coughs> from the 822 meeting. I move we approve this consent agenda. All right. Barry moves to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All right. Second by Aaron. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Down to board management and governance. We have some training tonight, and we have Emily from the BSBA to do our, to help us with our training. So I don't know, um, I don't know if you, we can run around so you. Most everybody has a name tag, but we can still go around and say. I love that I haven't ever worked with these boards before, so I haven't met really anybody except you, John. Right. Well, go ahead, Barry. I'm Barry Olson from Lincoln. I'm Liz Sayre from Bristol. Um, Sarah LaPearl from New Haven. Caleb Elder from Starksboro. Allison Sturdivant, Bristol. Aaron Lather, Bristol. Patrick Green, Superintendent. Well, thank Thanks. That's that's really helpful. I, I'm Emily Simmons. I'm the director of legal and policy services at VSBA. Um, I was just looking around and realizing I didn't ask you to bring a projector. And I have slides. Okay. So I need to get hooked up to do that. Um, and then I have about 30 slides. I have a lot of time on your agenda. Without everybody here, there won't be as much discussion as I anticipated. So I bet I'll be under budget for time if that's okay with you. That's fine, but I think people are going to keep tr trickling in. Okay. So, so yeah, <laughs> it so may, it we'll may. catch them as they come in. I have my laptop and a dongle, Patrick. Okay, and this is connected to the projector. Yeah, apparently I email. So now she's a remote, we go thank you. I use a meter stand. That's good. All right. Just don't let it slip out of your hand. Right, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Superintendent Green asked me to come to give 
As we did come and talk with all of you about budgeting generally, but to make sure that we focused on the difference of budgeting in a new unified school district for more than one town school district. And my office is gaining experience in this, just like school districts are gaining experience in doing this. Our training is developing as you guys do it because we've not had a lot of school boards who are our members who do this. So I know that some members of your board have attended the district management group trainings. There's one of those today. Can you raise your hand if you've been to one of those trainings? Um, and is the practice at this board to send the same group every time, or are you rotating folks out? It's been different every time. Yeah. Because it's in the middle of the work day. And yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So some of we've, I've tried to, um, first of all, not be inconsistent with those themes. It's impossible to not be a little duplicative. Um, I try not to steal their stuff, even though it's really good, so I've sourced them on a couple of slides. And my hope tonight is to get everybody talking about um, what it means to you looking at budgeting in this unified system um, and how this board is going to play its role, its proper role as a school board in that process. So. That function's not going to work. We're going to scroll. All right. So um, one of the first things to think about is that you have new opportunities as a unified board. Um, you already know and you've already planned that you were going to expand opportunities for students in this new system, find some efficiencies financially, and benefit from streamlined governance. So I wanted to warm up your conversational uh, muscles with sort of three loose conversation questions, talk to each other and tell me. As you embark on this process, what are your very initial high level goals for this budget process as a board? Um, just how you'll work together, what are your goals? Um, what contributions do you expect that the board will make to this process? And what information do you need once you think about those two questions? So, goals, what contributions you have, and what information you need. Just before we get into it at all, does anybody want to share thoughts on those questions? Yeah. Um, just thinking about my experience with budgeting in past school board and being a relatively new board member, um, I've just been through, I think, two budget cycles now with the uh, old Starksboro board, and I just found that I always am, am hoping for um, not just to, not just ways to understand the budget ourselves, but ways to understand it in a way that's useful to then talk about it with our communities. So just sort of, I guess we talked a little bit about, and I know it's always really complicated with budgets and with a unified district, I imagine, uh, aspects will be more complicated, but the shifting kind of line items, I think, are, are always going to happen where you have one position that comes from over here and the money moves over here. So if you're reading across a budget, you're not always going to say, aha, here's a big increase this year over last year because very possibly that came from somewhere else and it's not really an increase once you get the full explanation. All that to say, I'm interested in just um, working with, uh, with central office and, and um, Superintendent Reen to just sort of understand a framework for the budget that helps us understand what are the categories and buckets to not have the finest tuned understanding, but to kind of see what are the big moving pieces, what are the trends, um, the kind of departmental trends and changes so that if someone asks us in a meeting, we have at least a relatively cogent um, big picture uh, understanding. So that, that's something that is a goal of mine, to kind of have that work towards that type of understanding and obviously we're going to have to be able to get in the weeds sometimes but I think that kind of budget narrative is something that maybe isn't always front and center and I think is helpful for people especially as we tackle a bigger budget. I have a clarifying question. You use the word budget narrative. Is that a term that has meaning here or what do you mean by That's just something narrative? I just said. Uh, that was, I mean, what I mean by that is just to be able to say here's the kind of story of how this budget compares to last budget um, what are the sort of, because um, I know in the Robinson board last year, we had help from our principal, Adora, to kind of say, what are the real goals of the budget and how does this year's budget um, approach some new goals compared to last year? And that was just something that was, we liked having at this town meeting kind of as a tool. And, and 
more of that kind of tool. It's just all that kind of communication element of it. Um, I don't know that clarifies it at all. Does anyone want to respond? Is it? I'm so sorry. I'm learning names. Oh, Caleb. Caleb. I was going to ask Caleb. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond to Caleb talking about big bucket items and also having a narrative idea of the story of the budget for your own goals, contributions, and needed information? I, I would like to say first, this is because I've been doing this practice at my office, is so these are would be like our goals, three of our goals that you have on the screen right now as far as you know what we want to accomplish with unification. And so I would like to just be able to understand how the budget supports us achieving those goals. And I think that just goes to what Caleb said, you know, an understanding so that you know you can have an intelligent conversation about, well actually we are accomplishing what we've set out to or here's what we intend to do to accomplish what we've set out. I think um, I'd like to be able to think about it as the big picture, but also be able to generally understand um, what's happening in different, in the six different pieces that are making this up, plus the three k. But I want I want to be able to do this narrative on in two scales in some ways, or be able to answer questions about. So you're imagining that there will be a budget story and then budget stories, like six. Well, I don't, I don't, I guess, want to get into like way too much detail about here's what's happening in each individual school. But that, I think that transitional conversation, people are going to want to know that and we need to be really careful about how we explain the budget process that happened from individual schools, because it is really different when it's back, when it's together. Okay, that's a good thing to think about. But everybody comes to the table, who's been on a board before, not everybody has, comes to the table with the practice of budgeting in their local situation last year and the years before. So, I, I, our goal is community engagement. It seems like the training so far and um, this is a huge topic. This is a big deal. This is this is kind of seems like if we, if the if this board is saying what we want, not how to do it, and does this board participate in the budget differently than they used to? Maybe people will expect that you can answer a certain question about start with the elementary, or do they have? Are they getting the new gym mats or something? Like I don't. I, so. I'm a fresh start on what our expectations are for what to do, but I do know that probably every time we have community engagement, people will ask questions and expect us to be able to respond with some information, helpful information. For my information, can you raise your hand if you are totally new? This is your first board. Okay, hi, welcome. <laughs> so excited to have a new school board member. So, um, I think this is, this is great, this is what I wanted. Uh, we're gonna cover a lot of those issues or uh, get to, I'm not gonna be the expert and tell you, we're gonna get deeper into those some of those issues you raised as we keep going. So I'm gonna move this on unless there's something else right now. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking that because this board is new and um, the existing boards, especially last year, there was a connection with the policy governance piece where we were connecting what we needed to our ends and that's going to be another another piece of information that we'll need is showing how this budget is a product of what we saw in our ends monitoring, what we saw, we needed, what we what we're good with, what we don't, you know, how we connect. These are the ends. These are the goals that the community gave us a long time ago, and you know, here's what we're doing to meet those, to continue to to get closer and closer. And I just think the point you brought up is, is a really important one. And it, I think ties back to what some other folks are saying. And prior to getting out in the community and fielding a lot of questions about the budget, we ought to have a conversation here about to what extent do you all, or you, should you all be expected to know the details? Like where, where's that line? If we can collectively agree on, this is the line um, at which we stay above in terms of the, the 
big picture of the budget to not get into are right. we getting the mats at Robinson or not? Um, so we all have that same expectation of ourselves and one another, and we know how to answer those kinds of questions that are sort of within the, the expectations, but we also know how to respond when somebody asks a question that goes into a level of detail that isn't expected of you to know. Uh, just to prepare you for those community conversations that you're going to have at Shaw's or at the Lincoln General Store or wherever you happen to interact with people on your regular basis. Yes. Allison. Thank you, Allison. Um, to echo what Aaron was saying about um, informing people what savings we're seeing in the budget because of the unification, I think we would would need to extrapolate from our Act 46 study report the anticipated savings and say, well, this is what they were, this is what we've done, and did we meet those, did we meet those expectations? Because um, it, for everybody outside of the boards, it boils down to money. The budget narrative is a good thing to have. Um, but for the majority of folks, it boils down to the money and um, how you're spending it. Does it make sense? And yes, we have to explain how it meets the ends and everything. But there was a lot of conversation about how much money we're going to save by unifying. And so I think we need to be good stewards of saying it's a good thing to do and show them. And if we don't, then we don't. But at least we're being transparent about it. No, I mean, I, I, I like what Don was saying, and I kind of feel like, as I was saying that the first thing I said, that idea of how it, how some of the budget generally ties into the ongoing ends is just like a helpful anchor point for, for me, like just to start with also, but I also think that you get into the minutia and it's better left for parents to ask their principals or other people in their local buildings and not try to get that information from us. And I totally agree with Allison, it's about the money at the end of the day, it's just and a lot of our conversations with the Act 46 study committee, there's not a ton of money we're anticipating saving right off the bat. Now there are, there are efficiencies, there is money to be saved, and but there's also increased opportunity and educational opportunity and greater equity for ENDS policies. And, and so just as long as we can kind of hit on that and stay at that level, I think it's really important. But not to get into the trap of like, oh shoot, there's not half a million dollars of savings this year somehow this isn't a good a good effort it's important to have the two i think we have to be talking just about those um, means and promoting promoting this you know the school through the budget process you know always taking an opportunity to say here's all the good stuff that we're paying for here's all the good stuff we're getting for our, for our money basically yes i've also actually the inequity piece i think we actually cannot go into the budget without looking at what we used as evidence of inequity in Act 46 and finding a way to make it more equitable. And so happy to hear that, because I took the liberty of pulling out a couple of things from your final study report in one of my slides. So we're gonna get a chance to look at what jumped out to me as some deliverables. You guys are, are gonna get into it more after I leave, I'm sure. So I'm gonna move us on to talk about just generally, this is not tailored to your school district, this is just generally when you unify the system, what opportunities can you expect? So pooling resources is one, really driving all your collective resources to your goals for student learning. So pooling all the things in this list, expertise, programs, technology, uh, professional development time, and leadership time. You know, here's the one school board meeting that your leadership is going to be at once you get operational, and that's going to be huge. And I know you talked a lot about that in your study committee report. There's actually calculations of administration time that could be saved, and that's that's going to be huge in budget development too. Uh, one budget instead of seven, six, and then seven, and then seven, budget. Okay, seven. thanks. So. Um, Ideally, unification will, over time, allow a more precise approach to your staffing across your whole system based on changing enrollment year over year and changing class sizes year over year. Um, and can allow you better support to your teachers so that they can focus on their teaching craft and get supports across the system where they need to be at the moment. 
So to get there, to achieve some of those deliverables, it's important to remember that um, basically doing too much too fast can freak people out, is how I would sum this slide up. Uh, focusing totally on your logistics and mechanics in the first year uh, is good because you're excited to do that stuff, but you could miss some opportunities or experience implementation fatigue moving too much too fast. So smarter approaches to develop right now while you're enthusiastic and it's fresh on your mind, some multi-year goals and plans um, that's bold but takes those in manageable bites over the years. So that, that would be in a perfect world what you would do and, and strive for. Any questions about those past two slides? Okay. So a strategy to get you on that path um, is laid out here. So these big green squares would be your strategic steps. Uh, and then in green are just some examples. They wouldn't necessarily apply in every case to you guys. But um, if you plan, then communicate, share um, your expectations, get um, like a first year quick win, I know is what DMG talks about a lot, some things that are low hanging fruit that were identified probably in your study committee report as immediate savings. Um, and then capitalize on all of that to long-term comprehensive planning for lasting change. So some of the examples here may apply and maybe not. Maybe not. I think they're all um, administration level examples of things that Patrick and his team might bring to you in this or future budgets for some of those operational efficiencies. So just to get your creative juices uh, flowing about what you might be able to do one day. So there's a lot of text on this slide. I didn't get into all of it, but any questions here? All right. So important to keep in mind that uh, roles and responsibilities are still very crucial and it's great that you're a policy governance board and um, and so you have a very clear understanding and um, codification of those roles and responsibilities in your executive limitations um, so clarity at, at this table about what level of budget detail is a board decision and administration decision is going to be important to have a common understanding before you get to, I don't know, January and things are stressful and you've got a ticking clock on when you're going to present your budget. Um, formalizing that decision-making authority will require some, maybe not hard conversations, just some important conversations, um, but prevents a potential leadership crisis or power struggle, which you guys would never have later in the process. Um, and then to to transition from the way of thinking about town board level oversight to large district oversight um, is important. And I, I hear you guys saying things in our first little conversation that indicate that you are stretching your thinking and practicing that way of systems thinking. And I just would say here not to put too much pressure on yourself to be great at it the first year. You're going to learn as a board and you're going to establish practices that help support that systems planning over the years. Um, so the discussion question I have at this point is, as this new board, how will you strive to stay in your role, school board role and not getting too weedy, I think is how we usually characterize that, um, but communicate clear expectations for the budget to the administration so that your team can deliver on those expectations so that you get, um, so that you have goals for the budget and you get those goals out of the budget. And you're not just like, okay, we put a budget together, okay, you know, we'll do it again next year. So how do you, what are some, some strategies that you see to stay in your role or how will you know that you're in your role versus out of your role when you're communicating your expectations for the budget? Yeah. Hi, sorry I'm late. <laughs> I was, Kindergarten soccer coach. I'm Emily. Nice I'm to meet you. I apologize. I'm, I'm volunteering for one of our, our elementary schools coaching. So um, I would say that I think the idea that you said about having multi-year goals would be helpful when we're talking about our responsibility towards budget because if we have clear goals delineated, 
that would give Patrick and the administration our ideas of where we would expect the money to be flowing towards without nickel and diming each line. Um, and that would be a good way to see if the budget is actually meeting need our needs by whether or not we're able to achieve those goals and if we're estimating our timelines correctly. So that would be one way that I think we could do a good job. And the better I think our one, five, 10, 15 year plans are, the better I think Patrick could do to plan far enough out that we could actually save money for things or do other things like that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Krista. I was also a few minutes late. Okay. Um, and to add to that, I, we're in the midst of a strategic planning process, and I don't, to me, that seems like that great multi year planning process, and I hope there's a, a that we get to make that connection um, between the goals and action items that are formed out of that group and the what that looks like in the budget end. And do you have a work plan for that process? Does it work with the budget process, or is this year it going to be sort of a cart and horse situation? There's a lot of that in the reality of setting up a brand new district. But you know, you um, you got to get everything off the ground at once. <laughs> so it's not it's just inherently not the order that you would do it in a perfect world. But is there a timeline for that work? I'm just curious for myself. <laughs> it's very fluid timeline. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so based on where we are today, projecting forward, uh, we're looking at probably a midwinter completion date for the strategic plan. So probably just after we have to approve a budget, we'll have completed the strategic plan. So I think it's the cart before the horse situation you were describing for this year. You know, and I try not to say where the cart and the horse are. There, it's just a cart and horse situation <laughs> with this kind of stuff. There are carts and horses. Maybe they're, the cart and the horse are side by side. They're not one in front of the other. Just the Turns out the, the cart is actually a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have thoughts about how you'll know you were in or not in your role while you communicate expectations? And I'm, I'm meaning as a board, not any one individual board member's expectations. Yeah. Um, I'm very new to this whole process, so I'm going to need more information about actually what the sequence of events is, where, like, who's going to who, or how is it, like, is there an idea of these are our goals, and Patrick brings that to the principals, and they come back with something, and then all of that is mashed together in central office, and then comes to us, or is it a totally different sequence than that? I don't know enough about the Remind me of your question when we are done, okay. and we'll see if we answered some subparts okay. of your question. Well, I can just share some thinking about that too, because it's so the the concept of goals. So in terms of the, this board setting goals for the budget, there's sort of there are the ends, yep. which are kind of goals in terms of what we want to achieve as a system, um, and from that has been created the the strategic plan. That's what has driven some additional goal setting and action steps to realize that vision, mission, and ends. Um, so that work has sort of happened already for the board in that perspective, but there's also goals in terms of what's an acceptable target for an amount of money to spend that, um, that is acceptable by taxpayers, at least we anticipate being acceptable uh, to taxpayers. And that's sort of another kind of goal that's really useful. Like that gives me a target with which to work to say to my team, so we need to achieve these ends through this plan with this much money. Um, what I think is challenging sometimes is to not have a, a budgetary target set by the board and for me to have kind of a blank slate and say, this much money would be nice. Because right. that tends to not always be the reality. How do we guess how much a budget should run because to be honest in the past several years that I've been on a board I get presented a budget and because I'm not familiar with all the line items I can't possibly articulate what is a reasonable budget I mean we generally kind of get walked through it and then told by the principals and you this really is about where we can go and get what you need or we're going to be cutting X Y and Z with this budget because we just don't have the money or funds to fund this so I mean I would like to have that knowledge but I feel like I'm not equipped yet 
typically it's about a tax, it's a tax rate or whatever kind of penalties or thresholds might be set at the state level are, are two things that boards typically have used to say either, you know, we want to see a, either a tax rate impact no, no greater than X or Y um, or a percent increase, although that's kind of um, falling out of favor a bit unless we're talking about equalized pupils. So there, there are certain targets that often come from the state that I think help offer some guideposts for boards to make a recommendation to me to stay within those targets or don't stay within those targets. I'm going to say one thing before I let you respond. There is um, an interesting thing I learned while preparing for this, that the law requires school districts to communicate on the warning for your budget, the per pupil, equalized per pupil spending number, and, which is kind of new, the percent plus or minus that it is over the previous year. You don't have a previous year. So, A of all, you're not required to put that in the warning this year, and B of all, I don't know enough about math to know what you would use. <laughs> so that's just an interesting uh, bug, not feature of your situation this year. Mm -hmm. Do we anticipate, though, that the state is going to be able to provide us with an actual number as opposed to like the last, was it last year, where they gave us a number and then they adjusted it and there was a that whole confusion about, because that to me is the hard part. So in my mind, which we number would are you be, talking about? The equalized pupil number? Yeah, there was an equalized pupil number, and there was a whole question about whether or not you know certain small grants were actually going to be given and what level they were going to be given at. So we even couldn't anticipate what money we would be receiving in revenue from the state versus what we might have to actually add into our tax base, and it caused a lot of problems for you. But I'm just thinking if we're trying, if our goal is to communicate with the public about the state's expectations or limits and then give you back feedback about what our expectations are based on those two things. It seems like if they can't give us numbers that we can rely upon, maybe that's not entirely a system we should be relying on either. Because it seems as though it doesn't work in our favor. And it seems, I'm sorry, you guys are probably all really glad I was gone all summer. I'm sorry. No, no. So, I love what you're saying. Uh, so my thought idea is, is I thought when we were talking about Act 46 and district is that we were going to try to be more proactive as opposed to reactive and that we were going to try to implement plan-based initiatives and in our budget based on that. Like I think we were saying earlier where we really see a result or a, a storyline that supports why we're doing something as opposed to just saying, well, the state magically said 2%. So we're going to make it happen in 2%, even though really we needed 4%. I mean, it, I think it sends really bad mixed messages to the community when we say all these different numbers. And it doesn't seem like we, it seems like we always can make it work. So why don't they just ask for less all the time? And that's what I think they've gotten used to a little bit, and rightfully so. I'm that not is sure not really a question or an answer for you, but that's my confusion. I'm not sure we're going to get better numbers earlier this year than we ever have in the past. I think it's just the nature of the beast. Um, I do think we're going to get a fair bit of clarity from the state about what's expected in terms of budgets we're going to be purchasing. That just from what I'm hearing. It's I, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on reducing costs this year from the statewide level. And I, I think it might not be as voluntary as it's been previously. If you can see, if you can think it's been voluntary in the past. <laughs> So we already have a ballpark number of what it costs our district to run because you have the individual school budgets plus the central office budget. So we have that number. It's $30 million. Right. So then if we don't get in, if we stay district level, not school level, I would imagine you can aggregate for that budget narrative that you've already created what is it called? You know, the student outcomes, administration, those buckets you created, and I'm not remembering all of them. But it was very simple. So I would imagine you could aggregate. Maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds, but just about three slides ahead of me is all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would think it's fairly easy to know, and if we're able to <laughs> function with that amount of money at this point in time. Um, should be able to come to a number that's somewhere around there. Hopefully not. Because <laughs> we did start one of the first meetings I came to we did a slideshow that gave us sort of the overview of the consolidation. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be a good place 
to start probably. And then I just can't. Um, so I also, and so maybe you'll cover it, but a goal for me today is to learn. So I think the belief of the community, or what I believe, is that the school board makes the budget. And then, um, but then I learned that the state gives you an amount. And so, and then, so. Do we really give an amount, and does it really matter? <laughs> I mean, I don't the answer is yes to all of your questions. That's, that's the combination. So, yes, under, okay. under current law, which I'm always worried will change, you get your fully funded budget that you ask for. So you pay a tax rate that is reflective of, locally you pay a tax rate that's reflective of where you compare an about average of the spending across the state. So folks that pay, that budget for a little more spending than is the mean or the average, uh, pay higher tax rates because of that. But the system is truly statewide. So your dollars that you raise here don't stay here. They go to the state. The um, tax rate and the other factors are decided by the legislature and then checks are issued to you for what you asked for with one major exception, which was this past year, Act 85, which is a result of that veto session in June, where for the first time in my knowledge, the um, legislature said the school districts will not get their, their full education payment. We will deduct some off the top for the education payment. So under current law, as it's supposed to be, you get what you, you budget. You get it installments throughout the year from the agency of education. We have a two percent increase, and we go over a lot of years. What they say is, whatever you go over, you basically double that and give it to the state. But it doesn't go back to your education; it goes in the state's general fund, and the state can choose how to use it however they want. So not only do they already recognize that you're behind the eight ball and being able to fund whatever you need to run your school successfully, but we're going to take more money from your town, and stick it in a general else. fund, and put it wherever we decide might be fun for us. That is the frustrating part because. Then it's like, so do you, what do you do? Do you take away jobs? Because that's generally where most of our money is, is in people, which is 80% of our budget roughly. With people and insurance, it costs to fund the people that work so hard. And then we, or don't keep up with our buildings, because that's our other big budget. And that's where we get stuck every single budget so far that I've done. So it's hugely important to it's hugely stay important on that line. To it's try to line. think about it. The line is supposed to is under current law 121 percent of average spending. So it's again related to what are what's in the middle for this year for school budgets and folks that are the the intent is way 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 above that get double taxation on the dollars over that amount. Is that 121 percent of? Based on equal, it's all people. based on equal spending per equalized people is the number that in statewide budgeting is used almost uniformly. And that threshold, which is now 121 percent, began at 125 percent. So the threshold has kind of come down some before being penalized. So if the whole state decided half ah, we went up, then instead of going down. The legislature, the mean would that. be higher. Yep. And we've got half of Great. Then we have our, our whole renovation mixed into this, which is interesting because you said all of the things about how we've got money that is kind of like we've already accumulated this much extra that's already in the budget to put towards that, and there's a bond there as well. So that's like, that's a big deal. That, and that is a we probably shouldn't get too much into it because it's weedy, but that's different than your budget and your equalized uh, cost per people. There are some wrinkles yeah, right. in that logic. In a, in a way, the cost per equalized people would be better. Right now, there's a million dollars in for construction services, which counts against us for equalized people. If that if we do pass a bond and that million moves out of construction services and goes to long-term debt, we can apply for a waiver, um, and that money for long-term debt won't count against us. For the equalized people. Okay, so that will be equal. It doesn't count for excess spending. <laughs> I don't believe. Right, for, for the excess, for yeah. excess spending, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. So Emily, the um, the holdback that you're talking about for this coming year, the the law, that's because law. of the health insurance, right? Okay. Yes. Clawback. Yep. 
it's really <laughs> it's really dumb to call it a clawback because you never had the money. Right. They they reduce the amount of the check right. that they're it, supposed it, for to me. Do. It's a holdback. Yeah, I we should have been calling it a holdback. Thank a hold you. Back. You're right. It is a holdback. <laughs> no clawback. <laughs> it's a, a negation of Act 60 and 68, as far as I'm concerned. But that's um, <laughs> another issue. Okay, I'm going to move us on because that was that was pretty detailed stuff. Okay, so here is the v one VSDA articulation of the board's role in budgeting. So, um, so first of all, sort of establish a culture of care and concern with the financial resources of the district. And you alluded to that earlier when you said we're going to be good stewards of what we promised with Act 46. That's what that means to me, at least. Um, establish an expectation that in this district, taxpayers receive a really high return on their educational dollar investment. Um, give your administration very broad parameters, which you guys have just been talking about how that's difficult, but you'd, you'd like to do that for this budget. Uh, and focus on your cost centers, not your line items. So I've heard Caleb refer to that as big bucket items. Um, encourage creativity and collaboration in your administrative team and ensure an open and iterative process um, to build knowledge among this board and to make sure that your community understands what you're doing and why and that's communicating. So that, those are some ways I think you'd know that you were in your role when you're talking about budgeting, but it's, it's not that simple, obviously. <laughs> okay, so here's what I promised. Um, Patrick and Howard provided this to me. It is the supervisory union's current year budget broken down into just the biggest cost centers. So this text is very tiny. Um, blue is employee salaries, so that's your biggest portion. The orange is employee benefits, so that's next. Then off on this side, a different shade blue is other purchase services that says bus, transportation, insurance, etc. Then you have another shade of orange, which is your property, maintenance um, stuff, building and grounds, services that are purchased. Then you have supplies, you have equipment, you have dues and debt. You have purpose, purchase professional technical services. So those are just your big items. It's mostly employees that you guys already knew. And here's the the high level breakdown of those with dollar figures. So that's how you get to the, if you just lumped it all together and went home, $30 million. Okay, sir. Can I ask one clarifying question? Patrick, but are, are all of those things already consolidated? Like within, like is equipment already managed by in some ways one space or is it all, all in different? So there's room in some of these buckets for streamlining, potentially. Yes. Um, and there, there's sort of two, so there's <clears throat> streamlining sort of operations and oversight, which may or may not produce savings. It may just right. create other kinds of efficiencies um, that don't translate into dollars. Like a simple thing though, like the paper is all purchased by one source and that right so that so that some of that's happening happen. so okay. we have some vendors that okay. um, that all schools share so we do a, a bid and we have uh, a bid that gets awarded and everybody buys supplies from them right mostly that's just because kind of everybody's getting along it doesn't have to happen that way <laughs> um, whereas in a single district it's likely to happen and that happens in some cases in other cases we're not quite as organized around those sorts of things so are those the types of things that you're doing within central office now that we're going to have one district to do or um, I'm just curious I'm right now my my thinking is on bigger scale things right. even than where we're purchasing supplies right. from although that's a piece of it and mostly because some of those those smaller wins, we've done some of already. Right. And yeah, I was just was curious how far along that yeah. stuff was. So now it's, it's looking for efficiencies in, in staffing and different right. different yeah. way things we can do creatively to meet needs and meet the goals of the end um, and do it efficiently with the staffing we have. And that's the kind of stuff that you're going to have to 
going to have your hands full of <laughs> and talking about paper is going to be hopefully like, oh, no time to talk about paper. We're talking about yeah, yeah these, <laughs> these uh, bucket items. So yeah, another helpful diagram is to ask these questions. Uh, how are resources moving and allocated system-wide? Are there opportunities to increase equity in the way resources are distributed? And are there opportunities for efficiency in the way resources are distributed? So here are just some examples. These are not hard and fast below, but understanding large cost centers might be one. So Sarah, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit only because you go seem like it. you can handle it. So instead of asking, okay, is like paper unified, we you could ask questions more like, well, is a central office as tight as it can get, you know, or, or are you expecting something to come out of that cost center this year? So the, the, the curiosity is good, but just reminding yourself that there's a lot, a lot higher level to it than that is gonna be something I think you'll do a lot, a lot of reminding yourself. So these three questions might be, if you find yourself sitting in one of your budget sessions and wondering, how am I engaged in this? Do I need to ask a question? This would be a good cheat sheet for good board member questions to ask. I think Dawn is calling on people at this point. Rebecca. Hi, Dawn. Uh, Patrick. <laughs> Strategically, how are you in the big picture identifying these ideas of where the opportunities to increase equity and things like that are going. Do we have some type of outline of like how to make sure, I know paper may not be important now, but the idea that in the grand scheme of unification, district, whatever, we would address all the areas. And I don't necessarily care when you address them. I was just wondering if, if you actually had a plan in place on how we make sure we do get to all the areas and that we've looked at it from a high enough level to see maybe the best ways, not to save a lot of money. I don't think Act 46 ever thought we were going to save tons of money. But to really increase, not that everyone has the exact same thing, but that level that we wanted to raise the bar on for all of our schools and to get that kind of return that we would like the community to see where we become you know, a superstar. Uh, in Vermont for education. So the, we talked some about that today, actually. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, today was a, a district management group meeting. Um, so several members of the admin team and I were at this training for three quarters of the day. The focus is on roles and responsibilities. So who makes what decisions as we, as we become a single district and we look for opportunities for improving equity. Um, so understanding that's really important. And then understanding that there's a lot of layers to making those decisions and thinking about how that might affect schools. And really it's collectively the administrative team needs to have conversations about how do we define equity. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can think about equity and what it means to have equitable experiences and outcomes for kids, um, as well as equitable inputs sort of into the systems to get those outcomes. Uh, and we have to have those conversations so that we all understand the same definition of equity and then get a sense of where are we now relative to that definition or those definitions of equity and how do we get from where we are to where we want to be and how much of that do we achieve in year one or two or three, um, recognizing it's probably a multi-year process. So is it to too there. much in the weeds for like the school board members to be involved in defining equity? And yep. I think that You'll would depend largely on, are you talking about equity across your system and general expression of what equitable outcomes for kids mean? The equity he just said. I think he's talking about weedy equity. I think he's talking about like, do kids get equal amount of library time well, in all of our schools? Yes, but at the same time he was also talking about how we define what equity we're putting in, which means how the towns in theory would be providing resources for everyone to share, including our staffing and our money, and what's fair for, you know, different towns are gonna have different impacts. So in my mind that, I'm just curious if that would rise to a board level. I think what you're getting at is you might wanna ask questions for cost centers about, does this address, I'm sure that locally you, ha you know of some concerns, some equity concerns, does this address 
equity, and actually I'm just going to cheat and go ahead. You said you were going to address equities in your expanded learning programs. I think a, a good board level question would be, does this budget get us toward equity for our expanding lear learning programs? Or just for, for your staff line item, are all staff on the same equitable playing field for their money this year? So asking questions about does the budget get you to equity? And then you can decide for yourself if the answer to the question is in line with your definition of equity. Rather than getting into the point of how many expanded learning staff members are, are situated at each site and is that equitable? Yeah, That's, that gets to, to the weeds level. I'm right. just thinking that when I think about our ends and how we define those, uh, we did help define like thoughts and when we were talking about like executive limitations, we kind of helped define what we meant by some of those things. Equity is a big word. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, when I think about things that the community might have a lot to say about, I find that a lot of members in our community confuse equity uh, with equality and uh, everything being exactly the same for each student or each school, which is, I am guessing, not what you mean. Definitely not. And I was just wondering, as, as a board, if, if we needed to have that discussion, because maybe that's a message that needs to go out to the community, if that's going to be part of the message that we're going to be using in our budgeting when we're talking about all this equity. So just Anybody else want to respond to Rebecca with their thoughts about like what is what is the board's role in defining equity in any way that you're thinking about it? Well, I'm just thinking that there may, I, I, and I can't quite wrap my head around what their approach would be, but there may be a community piece that could provide us with some information when we're looking at things, um, rather than it being yeah, I think this is what my community defines as, or you know, looks at when they're looking at equity. Maybe it's a conversation with the community about what they see. That I could see that being our role, to understand the community's view or the community's definition of it. But I can't quite wrap my head. It's like I need a little more time to think about how you, how you would not open the door for those kind of conversations between the, the confusion of equity and equality, the, the, those two, those two terms. So I, would, I, but I would think that there would be some piece of a community conversation that could provide the board with some information that wouldn't get us down deep into the little lines and. Looks like she well, I do believe there are community members that sit on the action team called equity for the strategic plan work. I know it's a car or a horse, but it's that work is being done and with that group currently, which is, I think, very helpful and could be a place to, for the board to tap into. Mm -hmm. Liz, did you have Yeah, I was thinking on the next slide. Um, I saw equity there in the last bullet. No, that was a um, allow, yeah, allow enrollment changes. To me, equity looks like that, and that's a board thing. Okay, so how about I go through that? Like, there are pieces of equity. I mean, every school could be completely different with nothing the same at all. But, like, if this school is really accessible or has great technology programs or has sign language, I'd be like, hey, I love that school. So like equity doesn't look the same at all. I don't think equity means everything being the same. We don't have that in our homes. For equity among children, everybody likes something different and flourishes in a different environment. So a huge piece of equity to me, and I think the community would reflect that they all want different things. And so just having access to different things. So the board would be a piece of that, I would think. I can give an example of how this happens at our town meeting every year for Lincoln is that a lot of times some of the smaller um, elementary schools prior to unification when we've had unification of transportation or unification of technology or things feel like they bear a high burden and get little return for their specific community 
And one of the major concerns of all of our towns, I think, when we were moving toward a district was that we not lose our ability to advocate to make sure that each town still maintains at a high level or gets better. And so I can see that when we transition or we talk about costs or how the budget's going to increase or what school is going to get what, that a big feeling of inequity is going to come up with some towns feeling like they're not seeing a significant increase in what they had hoped to achieve in their school or that their school's not getting anything particularly more exciting or maybe their favorite teachers are being moved in an area that they don't feel uh, helps their children as much. And so I personally think, based on what I've seen in some of the other towns prior to this, that this is gonna come up big time with our budget. And they're gonna say, you want me to pay how much more money? And all I'm seeing from the Moncton school is that you're gonna take my favorite um, special education assistance out because they need, they're more needed in Bristol and I'm not seeing any increase in PE over here. And yet, yeah, I don't, I, as the board member, do not want to make those decisions. But I do feel like we're going to have to address them in the budget because every year we have to, ex or we've had to explain in Lincoln how equity does not require Lincoln to use all of their same resources every year that Bristol does if we don't have the same need. We talked about that whole idea of like buying insurance kind of for when you do have an outlier year for like special needs or something. But if we don't have a good grasp about what equity means or how we're defining equity or talking to the community about equity, I think that it's gonna be harder to make some of those schools feel like they're getting anything from this transition. Again, you guys were also happy when I was gonna say something to me, sorry. That was a good point. Yeah, it's really So if you're gonna take and you wanna be able to have the same resources at each school, I mean, that's the opposite of saving money. And I guess for me, the, the greatest <laughs> challenge with that is that's still sticking in the mindset of us Lincoln folks or us Moncton folks are only looking out for our Lincoln school or our Moncton school, and we have to sort of we have to shift that perspective a little bit because I think we we've, we've redesigned and redefined what our what our kids and our school is. I think that's a great narrative discussion to have, but if we're not prepared to have it, right. because I personally feel that the reason why we have so much trouble with this bond vote for Mount Abe is that the communities have not attached as much to the idea of this being our resource as they have to their elementary schools. And if we can get that feeling, then I think that we'll be far more successful when we ask for things for this school where all of our children go. But it is odd that we get so much support at each individual elementary school level, those same kids go to this school and when they get here, it's like a black hole and nobody wants to commit to it. And that to me suggests that we don't have a good narrative yet that's connecting with our communities to explain it. Um, so two things to answer, possibly answer Rebecca's comment about um, at town meeting time you're going to start getting questions about well you're moving this special educator from here to here we're not going to be having that conversation because we're not going to know what that is we won't see that in the budget it's a bucket and so it's up to the administration to decide how to allocate their resources and then it's our role to ensure that the outcomes we want to see for our students based on the ends are being met. And then how they decide to put, where they decide to put teachers is up to them. And for me, addressing inequities, well, we were doing this in the Act 46 study where we were looking at who has music, who has unified arts, who has wellness and PE, who doesn't? Is that something that we value as a district? Well, if somebody doesn't, if a school doesn't have it, then we need to work toward providing that. It's not necessarily the same amount of minutes per day for every school, but it's to provide something that we view as essential and important for our district to provide to make sure that we have that going in that direction. And I um, think like, uh, offering Chinese or something like that, that can be handled through the expanded learning programs. And every school's gonna be unique in terms of what they come up with because of the interests of their students. I know what Bristol's looks like, I know what it looks like in the summer, but it looks different than Moncton's and Starksboro. 
a little bit. I think there's an overarch or an umbrella that covers everything, but they have different things based on who can volunteer as well. Um, so I'm seeing it as a much higher level, making sure that there are programs that are equitable if we deem them important that each school gets to see. And we won't know where teachers are being moved. We won't hear about that. And yet, surprisingly, every year we have, supposedly. <laughs> I know they're not supposed to know Allison. So, so back to you, Emily. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just thinking, you probably will hear about the teachers who are unhappy that they were moved if that's something that you do down the road. So you might remember this conversation when that comes up and say, you know, we are the conversation that you will have one day about what you want for your kids. We decided to go down this path. There's pros and cons to every decision. So I hope that um, you set a path when there will be people who disagree with it. When they come to you with their disagreements, you'll remember why you made the decision in the first place. That's, I think that is being a school board member, honestly. It's like, it's the role that only you can fill. When I, I think it, along the lines of being a school board member, uh, Val Gardner at our training on August 22nd said something that has stuck with me that I think is important as you're fielding questions and, and having to make important decisions. And she said, as an elected member to a school board, you're elected by your communities to represent the best interest of the school. And now, how we've historically defined school is that building that's in the town where I live. Now school is all of the buildings in the five towns, so there's a, re a redefinition there. Um, but you have to make decisions that are in the best interest of the school, which sometimes are different than what the will of the community might be. So just because a community wants a decision to go a certain way, if you as a member of this board, with the information you have, which is different than the information that community members have, feels that's not what's in the best interest of the school, you, in a way, have to make a decision that goes against what your electorate wants. Tough spot to be in, but that's the job of a school board member. And the only thing I can say to make you feel better is, over the years, and it won't be you on the board forever, but it should all come out in the wash. You should make Bristol unhappy one year, Lincoln unhappy one year, <laughs> Sarsboro unhappy one year, around and around and around until Bristol gets unhappy again. Emily, they're all unhappy every year. Well, then it's already comes out of the box. We are equal working. opportunity <laughs> on top of it. Your job is done. I need to say no more. But okay. if the kids are getting educated and doing well, and we're getting good results from the kids, that's what everybody wants. So we do all win if we focus on them meeting those ends policies. So if we're getting there, then we're should have brought my gold stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I should a, buy some gold stars. And simple as it is, and recognize it is more complex than this, but the reality is that's that's where the, the line is drawn. Board works with ends, and you hire me and the 350 employees in our district to work through the means to achieve those ends. And so when you feel like it, we're talking means and no longer ends, that's when we have to assess, are we going a little too deep? I'm about to move us on to something much less cheerful. <laughs> you got you guys got into this earlier, but um, you you write your budget and then state level policymakers influence how much uh, money you'll be able to raise how easily. That's how I put it. So unless something dramatically changes, you will get your budget funded. But during the legislative session, they will make decisions that impact tax rates. That's what the legislature does. Um, one feature of the schedule of education in this state is that you all are starting to build your budget now. By the time the General Assembly shows up to do their job in January, your books will be mostly you know, done. You will be warning your budget by the time they get comfortable in their chairs in the General Assembly. They will begin to talk about the forecast for the grand list and the overall, but they wait actually until everyone sent their budgets to the uh, Agency of Education to see what the trend is for that year. And they use that to write the bill that sets the, um, the yields. They don't actually set the tax rate anymore. They fluctuate the yields. 
that's something that has been, a, that's not new, that's something that's come to light more as funds have become tighter, and it's just a reality, and it's something that you'll explain to your voters on town meeting day, and people will be frustrated like they are every year. So that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, this year, we have a second unfortunate situation, which is that due to the state budget, and funds that were used, there is what I like to call a $50 million structural deficit in the education fund this year. Uh, and Don and Patrick heard about this last night in our regional meeting. The VSBA is making this a theme of our regional meetings that we're having this fall to try to get the word out to school board members that the, um, the money picture's not rosy. And you, um, you'll make your decisions locally, but you deserve to get uh, this heads up that money is going to be tightened again this year. So just to break it down what happened this year, um, there's $43.7 million of one-time funds in this current year's education budget statewide. Part of that is the recapture, or what do we call it, the hold back? The hold back, which was almost $9 million. Um, $35 million were true one-time funds that bought down property tax rates last year. So it was $27.4 million that was just surplus. It was um, an overestimation of how much special education would cost statewide. And the Agency of Education has assured us that they are good at that calculation now and there won't be an overestimation next year. So this is a, a one-time trick that they've pulled. Um, and then in addition to that, the General Assembly decided to use $7.8 million from the Education Fund Reserves and that's a less common move. So the reserves can be, by, and you have reserve policies locally probably. My job, my nonprofit has a reserves policy. The reserves policy for the state is that they can be between 5% at the high end and 3.5% at the low end. Statutorily, they'll be in big trouble. I don't even know what happens if they go below 3.5%. Right now we're sitting at 3.6% with the money in the reserves. So, um, in addition to a lot of other things happening, the rates and the yields that get recommended to kick off the legislative session, the tax department does that. The folks at the tax department are required by law to recommend yields and rates that fill the reserves to 5%. So a lot of money is gonna go right up out of taxpayer pockets or your budget leeway, whichever way you wanna look at it, just to get the reserves back. Now the General Assembly does not have to go with that recommendation, but that number is going to get announced in a letter that comes out December 1st. And that December 1st letter is the first indication that school boards get that they can rely on of how expensive education dollars are going to be that year. So in combination with some other really yucky stuff, like more pressure on the Ed Fund, and we don't even have to get into it. Um, I would not be surprised if we are talking about an eight to 10 cent property tax increase when the legislative session opens. It's an election year, and so you can bet that no one will leave Montpelier actually passing an eight to 10 percent uh, tax rate. They, they will not want to come and ask for your vote and your constituents' votes after doing that, and who could blame them? So that, to me, means something, some, I think it's disrespectful, but I'm gonna use the term gimmick, is going to get floated and maybe passed in Montpelier with education funding. So that is de depressing news to give you because there's not a whole lot you can do except just be aware and stay tuned. And Emily, not that that isn't a dismal enough picture, um, but isn't it true that that $50 million is if nothing else were to change? That's before you spend one cent more in your budget than you did last year. And before anybody else in the state spends one cent more than they did last year. Or accounting for inflation. Does the, just curious, you know, the, I think they just announced like a $28 million revenue shortfall statewide, like an adjustment today. Um, that's going to hit the general budget. Can you? Is the education fund, I mean, I know it's its own fund, it's a little bit its own big, huge pot of money, but basically when we have general budget shortfalls, it's always going to put new pressure on the education fund, right? So last year there was a $35 million gap, which is 
not uncommon. It tends to be a little bit bigger gap um, when you get a new General Assembly. So right now we're in the middle of the biennium. Um, in light of that, or maybe because of that $35 million gap last year is when we had the governor come to the State of the State address or the budget address and say, we're going to level fund school budgets. Remember that? And said, so we're going to move town meeting day. Remember that? So that was a policy response from our current administration to $35 million short in not the education fund. That, that was, was the general fund budget. budget gap. So the response was, let's let's put a lot of things in the general fund. Now let's put them in the education fund because that is a self-leveling fund with property taxes coming in no matter what we do. And, um, and let's level fund school budgets to avoid tax increases. So I don't know what will happen, but that's what happened last time. That's set in stone. This is the budget that was passed with the veto session in June. This is, this is a baked cake. Okay. Oh, also there will be continued pressures to fund early childhood out of the education fund and badly needed higher ed increases, which you will not hear me argue against, but they have to come from somewhere and it makes me nervous. Um, so yeah. Can you explain the 35 million to lower property taxes? So that yeah. was money taken out of the educational yeah. fund. So and just this is something that school boards do too. It. So if you have money on the bottom line, you didn't spend it all last year, it's your surplus or your reserve or whatever you call it locally, you could save it away for a rainy day. You could use it all at once, which would lower the amount that taxpayers owe into the system that year. Or you could spread it out to avoid big, you know, rises and, and dips in people's tax rates, which tends to upset them. We, my boss and I, um, on behalf of you guys, advocated for that third approach, but they took the second approach, to just spend it all in one, in, in one go. Okay, so another reality that we are sharing at our annual meetings that I'm, I'm just plugging right here um, is that in the universe <coughs> of calls for cost containment, not all of them are, are bad in my opinion. You can make your own opinion. So Vermont has the lowest student to staff ratios in the country by far. We also have the lowest student uh, to teacher ratios in the country by far. It's like not really a contest. Um, so this is staff to students. So this is everybody that school districts employ. This is not teachers or licensed staff only. And this is um, three different years that have level data. So we've gone from 1 to 4.67 to 1.423. There's coming, there are fewer students per staff member. It's a trend. Um, we've been telling people at our regional meetings that way back when, in 2014, when this first became um, a stat that the Agency of Education let people know about, uh, moving from one to five would have saved like $75 million. And people got excited about that. And they said, we should do something about our ratios. 4.67 and five aren't that far apart. It probably wouldn't hurt kids in any way. It's just something we should do. Well, we didn't, as a state, do anything about it. The trend has continued, and now just maintaining what we had would have saved $86 million. Now if we went to one to five, it would save $175 million. So it's just, yeah. Does that take into account the fact that we've had a continuing decrease in student population? In fact, Vermont as a state has a decrease in overall population. We aren't even flatlined anymore. We have people leaving and not coming back. Yes, this is that reality that you're describing is why we're seeing this. Okay, so it's not like we're hiring more staff. It's really that we have a decrease in student population and we haven't been adjusting the staff down fast enough to accommodate it. Is that also taken into account any of that whole ghosting student credit that we get or is that without any fake When we show um, ratios, we use enrollment, which is human students. Okay, awesome. I would just like to point out that this is every person hired by the district, which is custodians, nurses, special educators, teachers, administrators, everybody. Everybody that you 
don't have that. So if we were to look at the student to teacher ratio, the number would be really, really, really different, especially for our district. We did, we did these numbers. <laughs> so people have to remember, this is not student to teacher ratio. This is student to people in the building and in the district. So to say you should go from one to 4.6 to one to 1.5 1 or one to five, what does that mean? Who do you move? What? And, and I'm oh, sorry, and what I was going to say is this includes special educators. And we have seen a massive increase in the need to hire special educators for a variety of, variety of reasons. Um, social services budgets have been cut, decimated, so the services have moved to the school. We don't get any money from the state to handle that other than through special ed special education. So this is misleading. <laughs> it's not intended to be misleading. It's intended to raise the kind of points that you're raising. Uh, everybody at the regional meetings is saying the stuff that you're saying. Nobody has been cheering this statistic being brought up. Um, it's just, it's a reality. Averages are hard. Averages have a lot of realities like you just <coughs> listed baked in. Yeah, um, it doesn't mean it can't be addressed, though. So I'm happy to share that my child has a one-on-one, -on -one, and if he perhaps, as a consolidated union, he could share it with somebody else that maybe had a similar need. I mean, I just think that there are things that can be done, and it's not just like a, like a impossible task. I think it can be taken on and needs can be addressed and money can be saved. I don't think that's like, a ta I think it's a task worth reaching for. Like that's a goal worth, worth going for. That's why. I would characterize it as something to have in, your, in the back of your mind anytime you're, you're making budget decisions or for any kind of decision. I don't know if it was first. Oh, I don't care. Go ahead. I always like what you have to say. You might even steal my stuff. <laughs> uh, well, I think I was just going to say that the, the special education um, funding is just an example as we continue to do our budget developments that the way we're doing special education is relatively new even before consolidation. And um, it hasn't been, you know, it was district, well, it was uh, across all the old school districts for the past how many years? Uh, three or four since special education went? Yeah, it's about three. Yeah, super yeah, yeah, super three, three, three. Thank you, yeah. So, I mean, just that, I think, is something that we have to keep on, um, just keep on uh, bringing our attention to in our budget development process, just kind of like that, that category and how... Yeah, the district is unified, but this has been unified for a little while, so it's actually a little bit ahead of our unification schedule, and so we are getting a little bit more data about that and about IT and about transportation and the things that kind of went ahead of our consolidation. I just think in our budget development, I hope to see that you know maybe we can start to I don't know I don't know what there is to sort of say there, but it's obviously a huge part of the budget, and it, and just because it is a little ahead of our general consolidation, I think it's important to um, I don't know what talk about it, understand it. <laughs> okay, so I didn't have time to get your staff. Can I still say my question. Uh, yeah. Sorry, your people be mad about. Oh, <laughs> so, so I don't think we're mad though. I think what we are is frustrated. And so what I was going to say is I have a different problem with the graph. Um, no, I don't care which graph it is. I have a problem with both graphs. So you can just say <laughs> and, and it's not because your numbers bother me or that the information is incorrect. It's absolutely correct. What you're providing us is correct. But the problem for me is that the focus is incorrect. Or it's lacking information that needs to be included, I think, in this discussion because we are ends people and not means people. And so the problem here is I don't care what the ratios are. I want to know how well my kids are doing in relationship to all the other kids nationally and internationally. And I can say that regardless of the ratio there, I haven't heard stellar examples from enough of our schools across the state, much less our current district, um, to show based on our, not just testing, but in general, that we're showing enough about how 
those ratios are either providing excellence, competitive to other places, or securing our students for being so successful for what they want to go do. And that's my problem with the graph because I don't care if I have 10 students in a classroom or 20, if the kids can't meet the need or the basic level of education required to go to UVM when they graduate here, I have a problem because we just wasted my money um, in my mind because that's our state school or a state school and we should be able to meet that level. Better yet, if we have these amazing ratios compared to the rest of the nation, I would like to know why everyone is not flocking here to send their kids to school here. And if we can't answer that question, then I would say we don't have a really good idea of what even our problem is to begin with. So I just, I always, like Allison, think that we need to be very careful when we talk to the community about how we frame these numbers because people get confused really easily not having all of our knowledge and training. But more importantly is the outcomes. We just, we don't monitor them just like with special ed. I don't mind if we share resources, but we should see how well your students are doing with one and can they actually meet their needs or exceed the level of education quality that we're providing them by providing them with a partner. Maybe it actually enhances their learning ability. Right. Uh, but we've never, I don't even think we have a mechanism to do that. measure that. Yeah. Congratulations. I, I think that we have new ideas for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'll see some mechanisms next month uh, in terms of how we measure in, in our ENDS report. Um, Great. I'll bring cookies. <laughs> Which isn't to say, so you're not going to see, see an exhaustive list of all the metrics we have available to us because there are a lot of things on a day-to-day -day basis that are used to assess um, are we meeting the needs of, of individual students. Uh, and the more individualized a program gets for a student, um, the harder it is to compare student to student and whether or not they're meeting those needs. So um, it gets, it's tremendously complicated. Having said that, I think conceptually I'm there with you there's not a ton of evidence to suggest that adding more and more and more and more people to the system is the way to improve outcomes for students. Um, if that were true, Vermont would be head and shoulders above everyone else in the country because we are head and shoulders above everyone else in our staffing levels. Vermont does really well, but there are states with different staffing ratios than what we have that perform as well or better than Vermont. So there's evidence that People you have ha is, a, is a factor, but it's not the driving factor. Um, but it certainly is a driving factor in terms of affordability and sustainability. And I'd like to include in your goals of being prepared with for UVM, also being prepared perhaps, perhaps for technical, perhaps to go straight into the workforce just by having like good attitude and some solid math skills. There's tons of jobs out there. So like to have, have a pretty wide range even, but be, you know, whether you're in school or you have a good job, but some, like to open up the measure of success beyond just. Oh, I didn't mean that. We had a student in a different district that had was the valedictorian, and she, that person mm -hmm. was not able to take her scholarship or his scholarship, I don't know which one it was, to UVM because they did not meet the qualifications. Yeah. And so that is my way to, unfortunately, you didn't have that background too. No not really push a button, but highlight a particular set of issues that we have been made aware of. I completely agree. Wow. Not all kids need, want, or should go to a four-year institution. It's not the definition of success. There are so many definitions, but we should be able to understand what our kids want, what they need to get there to be successful, and to be able to support them in making those decisions in a meaningful way before they graduate. Yep. And that's all language in our ends. I know, which is why I think we should I be able to measure them. gold star for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I read that in your ends policy. Okay, well, your gold star for gone. Yes. Someone right. else? This is a, just a random side thing, but isn't a lot of our student-teacher ratios based on laws that a lot of the lawmakers created to ensure that there were certain like needs met? And so it's sort of Heart and horse in a different way. Just um, the state set us up to somewhat fail in <laughs> monetarily. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna like I'm gonna law. end this segment of our conversation by saying we don't know a, some answers to the questions you're asking, but I'm hoping that we will because 
there was a mandated pilots. Were you guys in the pilot study, Patrick? The special ed DMG pilot study that was no. last year. Okay, we well, we had two. Eight or ten <laughs> SUs were in a pilot study that took place over the last year about staffing, specifically for special education, which is I think what Sarah's alluding to that special education laws may require a lot of staff. Um, so I'm plugging now. At our conference at Lake Maury in October, which is in the middle of the day and hard for working people to come to, the Agency of Education is going to present the findings of that pilot study. That's not the only place you can you can read it online when it comes out, but you could listen to a presentation. I'm really excited to see that. I'm going to be there because we have seen early indications that some of our kids who need the most adult attention are in a lot of cases with the adults who went to school to be a teacher the least amount of time. Is a yes. really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. easy way to say that. Okay, so we're stay tuned. Okay, I have a, you guys have been really good at discussion. I think we are over time, Dawn, <laughs> I apologize. No, no, we're but, we're still good. okay, we're good. So this is what I was hoping would be um, a global discussion. I was trying to tie together what I anticipated would be some some themes here. Good. So um, I think all school boards and especially school boards that have done Act 46 work, and I include you guys, um, have a commitment to quality and equity um, here especially to honor your board um, commitment to the policy governance framework, um, to respond as best you can to fiscal right realities statewide and as your local people express them to you as a goal that you signed on to in Act 46. So given all of that broadly, how do you feel that you would like your budget process to deal with, respond to, acknowledge, work with all of these imperatives? Uh, two things I was thinking of. One, um, being able to count on um, central office to give us the most current information that's coming out of the legislature so we know what the realities are outside of what's happening here. I think it's really important. Um, and then also there is a slide a few back that was talking about um, some questions that Came, would come out of our final study that we might apply to this first budget um, in terms of knowing whether, yes, right. So I was thinking, you know, for me, knowing whether a budget is a, a good budget or not, having questions to ask about it, they might be different questions um, each budget cycle, or maybe there are specific set of questions that we regularly tie to our ends policies, but having a, f a framework of questions that we can use to help guide that conversation, and then our administrators provide evidence based on that. So can I reflect back to you what I think you said? Yeah. So I think you a set of questions I would maybe call a rubric. Mm -hmm. Like, like yeah. maybe you would like to think about a short, easy starter kit mm -hmm. rubric that's just a board document that lets you know if you're. Um, if you like your budget. <laughs> right. Right. Allison, did you have something? I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> and Kristen. We're Glad back. I called on you then. Anyone want to respond to that or these questions? Or maybe that's just the answer. Thanks, Krista. Yeah. I like how you boiled the process down to four bullets. I thought this would take 15 minutes. <laughs> Not this. Sorry. This. Not this. This. Okay, so I have a case study that I think was alluded to, and I think the SBA uh, does this case study too much, but you have some people who have never been on a board before, so I'm taking the opportunity to uh, pull it out, and I changed it a little. So if you would please read this to yourself and then look at me when you're done. Okay. 
Okay. So, this um, soccer situation, what is the first concern that this question raises for you? Weeds. Yes. That is, I think, is the right answer. What's another concern, or maybe extrapolate from that a little broader concern? Okay, I'm gonna ask you to elaborate on what you mean by weeds then, just so we're all singing from the same sheet of music. Well, I mean, it's asking or assuming that as a school board member, we are involved in the budget at that line item level, and that we might be able to have an in information about how the decision was made and an impact on the decision moving forward. Yes, Rebecca. Um, my thought would be that, like Krista is saying, sometimes we get asked questions that imply that it's just about one school and that it's about one specific item that's of concern to one person, and how do we kind of take that and let the person know that they've been heard, though, because we also get in trouble when we make people think that A, we don't care, or B, we don't know what we're talking about as a school board. Um, but maybe advocate that we adjust the narrative to incorporate it more to ends and ensure them that although we may not know specifically about that particular sum of money, because it's bigger buckets that we work with, that we do know that we have a very specific goal of making sure that all of the schools have enough books and that their libraries are updated and that we know that we're going to be meeting that particular goal instead or something else. But we've had this question come up 800 times while we've been doing Act 46, not with the school library. I heard something about gym maps earlier. Well, it's not just that. We also have like individuals, some towns have like a, maybe a group that like normally donates money for like a specific activity every year and the main concern was can they still donate that money will it go to that school or now does it have to go to all the schools and can they not do it so we know the answer to those questions but who could sort of formulate a response to your soccer friends that expresses what i think it was allison and patrick were talking about earlier about being trustees for the district for all the schools in the district Sarah, what would you say? Oh, I don't want to answer. I was thinking okay. that. Sorry. Mary, what would you say? You haven't answered any questions this whole time. <laughs> he has to remain. We communicate via ESP. He's my That's dad. That's why I like self meeting all six. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it's nepotism. <laughs> Trying not to answer the questions, I just tried to redirect them to the district. But I don't know. People don't usually ask me questions because that's what I did. Oh. I'm really excited that you're concerned about our ability to make sure that our kids have new books. The district, we're really working hard to make sure that all of the schools have a lot of books and. If we do know the answer, I mean, I imagine I would actually know the answer to this. So I might say, you know, that particular sum of money is still dedicated to this particular town. But more importantly, I'd like to tell you about how we're making sure that we're funding all the towns. So no matter where your kid goes or when they move up to middle school, they're going to have an opportunity to use the same types of resources whichever school they happen to be in. Or if you have to move to Moncton because your job changes, I can guarantee that your kid's going to have a very equitable education opportunity with that library too. I'm not going to want to have that conversation, though. So I want to pick on one thing that you said. You probably would know the answer to the question because you pay really good attention. But do you think, does anybody, this is not just for Rebecca, I think there's a value in not answering the question even if you know about the library fund? Allison, what do you think the value is? In, not that exact, but a response that does not go there into the weeds with that person. Um, For me, the value in not answering that specific question is that um, it's a question of equitable access to the board. So these parents are coming to me because our kids happen to play soccer together. What about the parents whose kids don't play soccer with me or they don't do something with another board member? They don't have that opportunity to come to a board member or think that they can do that. But also, um, 
for me, I probably would just say, uh, thank you for your concern. I will pass that on to the board chair and the superintendent, and you can um, get in touch with them if you'd like, because I don't want to give somebody an answer that comes out of my head at that moment in time, because I'm not, I shouldn't be speaking for the whole board. Um, and they could take, somebody, it's very easy for people to take something out of context and say, you know what, your board member told me this, 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 and this, and so I just don't like getting involved in those kinds of things. So I just say, I will give it to the board chair and the superintendent. I'm gonna go over here first. Uh, I, I was just gonna say that I think that, I don't know, from the training we got earlier this year, I feel like we don't get to make it like individual like it's not about us individually and what our opinions are it's about the decision of the board and I would suggest you know where I appreciate where you're coming from but if this is something you want to advocate for come to a school board meeting and you know present your ideas and we'd be glad to hear what you have to say but I feel like it's important to not take that on as yourself as an individual because we're supposed to be operating as a board and not as individuals out in the community. Do you want to respond to that? Well, Was it a thing you were going to say before? Do you, no, I mean, and I hate to be the bad guy, but theoretically I'm fine with the idea that that would be how it works. But in reality, part of our concern of all of our communities was that they were going to lose touch with the ability to t reach out, talk to their boards, and part of our job as board members is to communicate with our constituents, our communities, whoever that happens to be. And although everyone might not feel like they have equal access to us, I have never turned away any person who has approached me to talk to me about something concerning the board. And if I don't have an answer, I'm never afraid to say, you know, that's a great question. I really don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Let me get back to you because a lot of people can't make it to these meetings. You know, these are hard for us to do. To get people on the board, we have to twist their arms because it is difficult to make time. And the idea that we insist that they come here to get an answer or that we can only give answers to the superintendent or even the board chair is what people hate about when we were doing budgets and they felt like we were being controlled, if you will, or given information and we were literally just mouthpieces. And so I think it's a fine balance and I'm not saying that I'm right exactly on how to answer it. But I do think we have to be really careful because if we alienate people from feeling like they're part of a process or that they have access to us in a real and meaningful way to them, uh, then I think we have proven them right about everything that they were afraid of with us transitioning to a district, or that's how I think they would feel, a lot of them. Um, the SBA, the next um, October 19th and 20th, it looked like they were really going to focus on community engagement and really going to encourage us to get out of the boardroom and talk to people so that we can figure out how to have these conversations and maybe if questions come up, we could talk about it as a group and then say, okay, this is what you can say about it next time that comes up so we do have one voice. And also, like, I am also a person like I'm not always a school board member and you're not always a superintendent like we don't like we can also just be a person that has an opinion in conversations with people and I can say the school board feels this or that's not a part of the school board conversation but I mean I, I didn't necessarily think that joining the board would mean that I no longer was able to like have a Right, so if we can figure out the community engagement and then when we're at those meetings and when we're at like a, the community engagement and learning how to have, because I, it's dysfunctional if we don't all agree and say the same thing when we're answering questions. Like I get that, that's super important. And if we just lose our um, almost like integrity if we don't all be on the same page. But that's why we're sitting here now and talking about it so that we can get on the same page and speak up. Right? So, maybe? Yeah, and I think um, maybe we'll get to it at some point if we hear from the communications folks. But, you know, uh, I agree that there was and will continue to be that concern of the communication piece. And, you know, perhaps that's where a school advisory group would. Um, be of value. I do think we need to have some sort of place to direct folks 
who want to get more involved in what's happening at their school, who have opinions about what's happening at their school, who might have energy and ideas to contribute to the school. Um, and the school board may not be the place for that, but I'm really hoping we have a place or a vehicle or a process um, because that if we have if that's not if that's lacking, we're going to continue to frustrate people. Your chair is next, I do believe. Well, I, it's along that same lines that we really have to change our mindset that the board meeting is the place where the community comes. The board the board meeting is the time for the board to do its work. The time to have that back and forth and more free exchange is in the community engagement piece. It's what bit all the local boards, all the all the past, it's what bit us because we didn't have that community <coughs> engagement piece in a way that was allowed a back and forth. We tried to do it at our meetings or we tried to just substitute it at our meetings. So we really have to change our, I think our way of thinking as this is the place where you come to get to, to have the conversation. Let's have the conversation in another format, in another way that's more open and allows, and when people are heard, they won't feel like this is a place they have to come to get their concerns answered. And we can do our job in a different way and still do our work here in another way. You still got something, Caleb? Yeah, I mean, just, I, I totally agree with what Don was what everyone's been saying really, but just following up on that point, just the idea that you, I think it's natural for people to think, hey, here's an elected official, and one, you know, the, the elected officials we have a lot of access to around here, like our representatives, and our select board members, and our school board members, and the first two categories, those are like legislative bodies where those are the deciders to some extent that you're talking to, like they're the ones that are kind of working on policy, whether it's just at the municipal level, at a small scale, dealing with the town policy, or at the state level working on statute. And school board members, particularly here, where we have policy governance, we're kind of a different category, but I think there's still a reasonable expectation of sort of constituency help, like for lack of a better word. So that's kind of what this sounds like to me. Somebody coming up saying, hey, you're involved, I'm wondering this thing. And I think that the answer is just sort of us getting to the point where we say, we know it's not my job to give you a substantive answer, which can seem like not very good, but it is my job to uh, help facilitate your communication with the right people. And I think, just to Don's point, when we have a better fleshed out community engagement avenue, part of the answer to this question is to direct them towards that avenue. And right now, part of it is to say, oh, well, you should really be talking to Patrick or somebody else, and we're not just always sending every person in the community to, to um, Patrick's personal line. But, um, <laughs> But to, to start to kind of know, like, what is that facilitation role? Because it is hard. You want to help, but th I think that's something that I've had to kind of wrap my head around is that the way that you can help is to kind of help, un help describe the process and help kind of be an advocate for that because what you can't do is say, oh, yeah, that's like on line 56 of the budget. And it's in there, baby, like, to stay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was the only point that I wanted to make sure got in the conversation that hadn't yet. And I'll state it another way, which is that, like, Let's not expect people not in school board, school board world to understand your role. Like, that's, that's not their job to learn your role. Maybe your job is to educate them about your role so that the next time they don't come to you first because that's not the best use of their time either. They, they know the process, um, like Caleb said. Okay, everybody gets a gold star for that one. Um, I just went into your work plan. I hope I got this right. It's publicly available on your website. So this is what you guys have put down for next steps. You have me here now. I'm budgeting training. Um, then you're going to be looking at a budget development timeline, discussing anticipated drivers and assumptions. That's the conversation. We'd love to be here for that. Uh, then you're going to have Give us a little preview. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I got the, the nasty news out of the way. And that's <laughs> um, then you're going to have one of your community forums and have a first draft to start working with. So you might change your process based on some thoughts that have been changed here tonight, but that's what you apparently committed to. Um, is, I'm curious, is the community forum like before the school board meeting? So what that has been in the past has been um, at least what we did last year, before the school board even sees the first draft of the budget and begins to formulate opinions about it, 
they're hearing along with their with their constituents um, what that budget is. So they're really so the community voice is present in the conversation from the first time the board sees the budget, so that it's really authentically um, sort of influencing the the thinking and the processes from that point on. <coughs> Any thoughts on that for the larger work plan? There was a lot of other stuff in your work plan too. I just focused on the budget stuff. You guys are busy. Um, and then to, to get to that point, we're jumping ahead now past, um, like formally past that sort of community forum to talking about when you present your budget at town meeting day. That's the law gives you the responsibility in section 563 to present the budget to the community. Um, but I think you should think about it as your job from now until town meeting day. That you, as, as soon as you have an idea about the budget and the administration is, and they, they have to get one together, you could start collaborating with how to present the themes or the narrative, what do we call it? The story or the narrative, budget narrative. or the budget? The budget narrative with the community um, to connect. I think this is maybe one of your most important roles, period, but it's your most important budgeting role to help make connections between the budget and your ends policy or in other places your vision and mission and goals. Um, so one good strategy might be to early on engage the community, sounds like you're checking that box, um, in hearing their broad priorities and communicating you know, what your broad priorities are for the budget. Yeah. So to go back to the previous slide, Patrick, you mentioned that you're hoping that the electorate essentially here's the budget at the same time the board. So we did last year. Yeah. Right. So um, I would almost think that they would, we would want to engage them at somehow around the October meeting where you're actually discussing the anticipated drivers and assumptions about the budget because then the November piece, you really do have a budget put together. So they're not really provided an opportunity to give you feedback. Um, or maybe the feedback is too late. Mm -hmm. If you knew it more ahead of time in the October part. Um, That's something to the, thought. when we meet in October to look at the, um, the timeline, we should have that discussion and see what what the will of this board is in terms of at what point uh, do we engage the community? It could be, it could certainly be earlier than that November, which is a late November date. Good to know. <clears throat> but right. the idea of being thoughtful about the entire budget building process so we can think about when in that process is the time the board wants to engage the community. And two, I had two notes on the bottom of my slide. One is that with a bigger district and multiple communities, I think you should be mindful about distributing information uniformly across schools. So um, I'm thinking of like the rumor mill that could get started around the budget or the, the festering concerns that could pop up in January with your budget, uh, being really deliberate with uh, and proactive, I think, with your budget narrative and pushing it out to all communities is important. Um, and then I think we said this earlier, help educate the community about the role of the board in budgeting district-wide. There's no reason that they should already know that. I think that's your job to, to help them learn about that. All right. Oh, that actually went with that slide. Okay, so here's my confused guy slide, which means we're at the end. Sarah, did you get any of your original questions sure. sort of answered halfway? Yes. You know when they will be answered if they haven't already? I'm going to ask Patrick. <laughs> okay, so my last order of business is to remind you that you're a member of the School Boards Association and we work for you. We work for a lot of other guys too, but you're part of the people we work for, so we are happy to answer questions. Sarah, you can um, call me with general like school board questions and um, if there's something that needs to go to Patrick, I often talk to the superintendent also. So we're just a resource for you. Um, you probably know Harry Frank who worked in my office, if you're an experienced board member. Now uh, we have a Susan Holson who's equally as awesome and you'll probably get to work with her at some point soon. Um, Nicole and Susan are in Brattleboro at a regional meeting and I got to come here instead. So uh, our annual meeting is 
October 19th, and we would love to see all of you that can make it at Lake Maury. <coughs> Thank you. discussion the community engagement advisory council the minutes were from that meeting were included in the packet and Caleb I believe you're chair of that group so yes I am certainly add, part of it wanted to uh, add anything yeah um, I could I could kind of I could certainly add anything but I don't know if folks have questions based on anyway read through the minutes um, but uh, yeah, it, it was just Andrew and I were there. Uh, and at the last minute, he did cancel, so we missed her that time. Looking forward to meeting with her next time. So we do not have a. I was actually hoping that we would kind of put our heads together and schedule our next meeting tonight, um, but that's not happening. So we're gonna. I'm gonna reach out to Andrew and Jen to schedule our next meeting ASAP because we want to certainly have it before the next time this group meets. So that's going to be our goal, I think, to, to meet before our next meeting next month. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I think the minutes, I tried to capture the gist of our conversation in the minutes just so we could read through. We didn't take really any, um, much of any actions, but really just kind of, uh, just said two agenda items sort of uh, discussing survey format questions sort of bigger question just of how do we want to reach out to community and how do we how do we reach out to them to ask them how we should reach out to them in the future that sort of somewhat circular question um so we tossed that around um it was great and uh and then we talked about the potential role of school councils kind of using that previous discussion as a jumping off place and i don't think we came to any any conclusions, but um, what ideas we had, I think, are somewhat captured here. Hey, Caleb, can I tell you something cool I saw at an airport that I've never seen before that I thought you guys might like? Okay. So they now have a thing where you walk into the airport and it's um, like, how was your uh, experience through TSA? And it literally has a little thing and it says, how was your experience at TSA or whatever? And then it literally has a happy face and a sad face. And you literally just press it as you go by. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, if we ever wanted to get information from the kids at school, it would be really cool if we could put one in the front lobbies of buildings or whatever, <laughs> and it has one question, like, you know, how do you like school lunch? Happy face, sad face. And just let people press it. And it wouldn't give you a lot, but it would give you a lot of probably responses because I think kids are happy to press one button, yeah. you know, like, yeah. even adults. I think deploying a I'd never seen it before. A regiment of survey bots around our community sounds nice. I don't know how much they are even, but I thought how cool or maybe at Shaw's, like to get into Shaw's like yeah. Absolutely, yeah. The door only opens if you press a happier sad face. Well I well I think that the point that I think is finding good ways to increase the feedback loop is huge. I mean that's kinda of what it's all about is yeah, it's great to have really granular, lots of information, but it's kind of just nice to have any feedback, you know, and, and to some degree, making that easy feedback to give is, is uh, I think, could be key. And I think one thing we discussed was just multiple points of contact, but also just, um, so we did get these questions uh, that maybe would ask people, um, how would you like to be engaged by your board and sort of give maybe some choices and just that kind of question. and. Who would you most like to hear from? Some of these ideas were Andrews that I, I liked. Um, one like, who are we interested? Would it be nice to have an event where we regularly knew there would be outside experts um, to come and speak to us from wherever in, in the state or nationally, or just on kind of education issues? Just sort of saying, here's a, a standing community forum event that will have a combination of uh, information about our schools and how our kids are doing. A little highlight of somebody regionally or statewide is you know something just that kind of builds in a little bit and to ask people if they would like things like that and then also just um, profiles of programs more than just and maybe profiled by students I think of um, when we've had uh, our carousel meetings and had some of um, the uh, pathways folks in to talk about it. I think Carolyn Carrera came in one time 
Mandy came in one time to talk about expanded learning. The and came. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of thing, in like a community yeah, engagement kind of thing, uh, I think it would be so great because you do get a certain built in audience. If you start having some students coming and the parents saying, oh, my kid's giving a presentation tonight at a school board sponsored event, like that's cool, you know. And it, Hopefully it's cool. <laughs> and have free popcorn. <laughs> and so yeah, that was the kind of discussion we're having. I think similar to the discussions, frankly, we've had before in our larger group, Act 46. But um, and the one other specific thing that came out as highlight, Andrew was kind of talking about this vision for 2035. Just thinking like kids who are born today, that's the year they'll graduate, and that reminded me sort of some of the Five Town Promise um, work that's happening and thinking about how do we unify those efforts um, and kind of that general question. Because I think having a bunch of related goals or related ideas with like similar, you know, that's not always, I think we want to build on what we already have going to some degree is just my take, but. I find myself that channeling my inner Val, I, which is kind of nice, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in, in conversations with Val, as she's been thinking about the community forums and just the role of community engagement and the and the board's role in engaging the community. And as we're talking about this community engagement, um, I think some thoughts that she has shared will help shape potentially what that is, that community, the board's role in engaging the community isn't so much creating events that school personnel have to facilitate and run and pull together to engage the community. It's not about the school engaging the community, it's about boards engaging the community. So it's, it's your opportunity to talk with constituents and hear their voices and understand their concerns so that you're representing them at this collective table less than it is about putting together presentations that school folks come and provide. Um, so it's, it's the board's work of engaging the community is the, the intent behind that engagement. So what do we call it when the committee wants to have more information about the school side of it? Yeah. yeah. Because to channel yeah. Val, I think she would say that our regular board meetings are not the time right. for that. Correct. So we've got to say, what is the time for that? But it could you know, just be to some us. Degree. Like, yeah, it could just like be us. us. And I agree that it's good to not add more but, meetings to the we could have neat speakers come along and instigate and like instigate little uh, controversial conversations. <laughs> I mean, that's I possible. Because of company excluded, you're not yeah. instigated by anyone. <laughs> so I mean, right? The board has like there are the VSBA. I'm sure could guide some of that. Awesome. So I like the um, idea of the, the two buttons, happy or sad face, on a, a question. And even though it might be, how do you like the food, it, it's a broad question, but it starts the conversation. And then we can start delving deeper, but we need to start at least with some sort of question. Um, so I think starting with our the big questions that we, we do have and that we want to engage our community on, that would be a fun thing to do and then um, I'm thinking about up at UVM we have the, the medical side of the community has their grand rounds and it's once a week we don't have to do that but maybe once a month we would have a specific speaker come in and talk about something relevant to our community at that time maybe somebody would come in and talk about budget process planning or uh, some other things, and I'm only thinking that because you're sitting right there, um, <laughs> but to, to set up kind of a schedule where we know we're going to have that topic, somebody will introduce the person who's going to speak, um, we have somebody come in and talk about personalized learning or proficiency-based learning or tech and career ed, um, college applications, um, I know those things happen in school, but gives us another opportunity. And I think the, when I'm thinking about community engagement, I think the, the fear that we've discussed some here tonight is communities want to know that they all have an opportunity to bend the ear of board members. Like that's the kind of engagement. They want to they feel like their voice is heard. 
I don't think it's so much that I don't think people feel disenfranchised with their schools right now that there's not enough events happening at their school that they can go and participate in and learn about what's happening. It's not that we need to increase those events because they're fairly numerous already. The fear in consolidating is that they won't have their local board that has all of the control over their school to talk to and influence what's happening there. So those are the kinds of things we need to reassure folks that, that there are going to be opportunities for you to talk with your sort of local representatives uh, so they can bring your perspective and your concerns and your voice to this table as we're making those decisions. I agree with you. Surprisingly enough, that much change. But um, I think, you know, we could just have some like coffee events like in the sure, morning is. where it just says like, you know, uh, like the old fart club or whatever that goes and have it. We could have the school board once a month or, you know, once every couple months or once a quarter be like, you know, we're going to be at the Bristol Bakery. They probably love that or whatever. Or we're going to be here at the Mount A large cafeteria in the morning. Students, families, whoever is welcome to stop by. We're just here to chat. But I do like Allison's idea, too, about having important conversation starters that they could come in with, like, a topic in mind. Yeah. Because, for example, I thought Allison's point was really good. If we already know about the stressors that are going to be on the budget, that number, I don't need them to wait until they're already pissed about the number we're going to give them in the budget. I'd rather have them be pissed about that now so that it, it stems and like ebbs down and then they realize it has nothing to do with us and that we're the victims really in all of this. Yeah. And, and then and but, you know, coffee for us. They, work, I mean, they work through their stages of grief. You know, they can be mad now. We can talk yeah. about it all now. It gives them time to express their dissatisfaction with the legislature. Uh, in a meaningful way and have these conversations in advance of when our budgets come up. And I think, you know, we could have one night that says, uh, you know, budget stressors by the leg Vermont legislator, come chat with us. And we have, you know, a potluck event. We all bring a dish and people can come and hang out with us. It doesn't have to be an event or we could time it out to be like around a basketball game or something. So like we happen to be here when a bunch of people are already going to be here. Um, and they can come chat with us at halftime, or we could be halftime and go sit in the middle of the basketball <laughs> oh, at halftime. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not afraid to put myself out there in whatever way is convenient to people to access us. But I do think that, unfortunately, they don't just want to talk to us because they don't even know what they want to talk to us about yet sometimes. Well, that's where I think, you know, it, it could work as a vehicle to support what you need as much as it can be a vehicle to support the community. So the community just wants to be connected you want to know what the community thinks about certain topics as you have a big decision coming up. So to say, you know, so you just gave a great example. We have to make decisions about a budget coming up soon. We really want your input. Here's what we know now, big picture state level. We want to share that with you, hear your thoughts, hear your concerns, let you hear our concern. Um, and, and so that way it gives a, a purpose to the meeting, uh, which may draw more people. Um, people like to talk about budgets. So that may be a draw. Budgets and math, those are two things that just people come out of the woodworks to talk about. Um, but use it as a vehicle for you, and simultaneously, it satisfies a desire that the community has. Sir, one random thing that in going to the various coffee shops or starter places or things like that with the topics in mind, it's almost better to send people from different towns to a third town and like totally mix it up and see and like make us all part of yeah. um, the same idea instead That's of right. just hanging on to your town and yes. that piece like actually then you would have a little bit of perspective also as a board member walking into the, the Bill of Green Market in New Haven or walking into you know, wherever and, I don't know. Mm -hmm. so and it's, it like you're looking it's out full it's full it goes both ways there'd be like we're, we are all in it together yeah. so yeah, and I'm just going to add that um, getting in front of big decisions, I think somebody mentioned that, is really important. Um, you know, again, thinking about Emily's presentation of, you know, if there were conversations about future things to consolidate or future efficiencies or big pushes that we're making as a district, getting, having conversations with people about it before it happens is a lot better than giving them a place to vent after it's done and making yes. them feel like they're part of the decision um, and not just responding to it. 
because it just sounds similar to what was successful from what I heard about the staff negotiations. Like that kind of thought process, deal with it in the same sort of way, but just obviously it's what, what was successful about that was following through and like hearing people's concerns. It sounded like staying in front of it before the big days here. So I don't really know what that looked like, but if there's more training or information around it, if, we, if you got really positive feedback in that difficult sort of situation, maybe we could use that same sort of process in a way. What was successful? Like, let's take that and move it into the situation. In a way, I don't know. It just trying to think like of the correlation really between well. the two processes. And yeah. it feels different There's to me, but yeah. Process, the critical yeah. issues are critical issues. Right. And if you can keep it at that level, instead of the you know, going around two people to a different two individual people to a different town. It's all about the lizard brain. Yes. In relationship by objective. Um, it's a good segue. To, we put it on the agenda, the, the labor management. We did. We did. But I just want to. Whenever we're ready, that's me. a great I, segue. Do you do you need anything from us? Well, I mean, I think the, I mean this is a great kind of just discussion to have and try to capture and bring some back. I think what we'd like to do is have another meeting and come back to our next meeting with a uh, with something more concrete to approve, uh, basically, and I think it is a little bit, it feels a little circular at the beginning, kind of thinking what comes first, but what I kind of hear, I, I keep coming back to is that I could see us having a standing quarterly meeting that maybe has a little bit of seasonal differences, like one is really focused on, I don't know, legislative stuff that's happening at a certain time of year, one is maybe to focus on, we're doing budget de development, what are the kind of questions here, or, I don't know. But that also it's stuff like really simple ways to put questions in front of people with smiley faces or whatever, or kind of on, you know, and I, um, one thing Allison had sent out that I, uh, maybe this isn't relevant right now, but it had to do with the, yeah, the, the strategies for promoting school support throughout your community. It was sent out by Allison. Um, I thought that kind of idea of, you know, a semi-regular column that somebody might write that is not maybe as fully fleshed out as like the scoop, which Nancy has always done the heavy lifting on since I've been on the Starksboro board. And I know that not all schools have a scoop, and I don't know if people want to have something like that, but the scoop for Starksboro is just like school news, um, basically, and also other stuff. Um, but just that idea of also saying, hey, maybe on our little committee we're going to say one of us, you know, and one time a year, so all of us three times a year, maybe each of us twice, whatever it is, writes a little piece just highlighting something. And maybe it's just highlighting the ELP program. This is awesome. There's a new, whatever, robotic seminar that happened. And it's just like notes from a school board member, like not trying to get into policy or just kind of quick highlights that kind of keep happening. And so I guess. What I'm looking to do is to come up with a little bit more of a specific list along with Jen and Andrew and kind of bring it back for approval to kind of start. But I feel like this is something that we're going to have to sort of build from the ground up a little bit and not just, what I'm kind of feeling is like we're going to have to try different things for a little while. And um, But I think that one thing I know I always struggle with in a bunch of different arenas of my life is not putting out a product until I feel like really good about it. Or like, oh, like I'd love to, you know, do do this one day, or I, but I got to sit down and spend like six months doing it. And what I find is a lot of the time, if you start doing more frequent small stuff, it leads to bigger stuff. And also, frequency has a lot to do with how people feel about things. Just like it's not always so much that you take a deep dive every time. And I just think we need to kind of be putting out little community outreach all the time and just to some degree see what, see what sticks. So I don't know that I need anything tonight in terms of a motion, but I just wanted to say that, that I, I feel like maybe our next step is to come back with a more concrete list of places to start and so that our next meeting will be looking for some motion to approve some action. Okay. I'll make sure it's on the agenda. Then. Thank you. And anybody else have any other questions? Okay. And then um, we did add an update from the labor management. Right. So um, we're going to reach out for information. Yeah. So Jody and I, and I are we're charged with looking into this forming of a labor management committee, and um, because of the 
uh, negotiation process and the, that we engaged with Cynthia Jeffries. She seemed like a good person to start with. So I connected with her and um, shared notes from that with Aaron and Jody. Um, and so the general thrust of what um, Cynthia and I talked about was um, the value of having such a committee, um, that that is sort of the next logical step for our group, having been through the relationship by objective training as a way to kind of keep the momentum and good communication going um, among board professional staff, support staff, um, but that all parties need to be in agreement that this is a good idea. Um, the purpose is really to continue conversations that could otherwise erode um, trust or relationships, um, but it's not a place to negotiate or deal with grievances. So an example that Cynthia gave and that I thought about tonight was that if, for example, there were the proposed changes or plans that impacted staff, um, having those this as a place to um, share those proposals, uh, the administration sharing those with staff and getting feedback and input before implementation um, is a great use of this type of committee. Um, she recommends that if folks that were on such a committee had not been involved in relationship by objective or the um, negotiation training we did, that it would be valuable for them to go through some of that basic communication um, technique and strategy training so that um, ideally, and we I think this was talked about through the RBO process, that those sort of communication styles and skills would eventually be throughout the district and not just live within the you know 18 to 20 people that went to the RBO training or that then did negotiations so that they they have longevity and sustainability. Um, I did ask because I think I was a little bit confused um, uh, about what the board involvement is in such a group, um, and I also know that that right now Patrick already meets with the two leaders of the association, and is that not the same thing? And she said, actually, yeah, it is sort of the same thing, only it's informal. Um, and she said that can work great, where relationships are strong, um, but if the dynamics change, those relationships could be at risk, and less so in a more formalized labor management committee. Um, and she also said, you know, if it's just limited to three people, um, it might be good to have a few more folks involved, again, with that idea of engaging more people across the district in that process of collaborative communication. Um, but that it's really up to the, the involved parties to agree on what the structure and membership would look like. Um, and that all of the participants would need, but, or the sides, I guess, would need to agree that this made sense. Um, she said that in her experience, boards aren't necessarily members on such a committee. Um, so I think it sounded to me like we would maybe be recommending that such a committee formally exist and then allowing um, administration and staff to figure out what that would look like. Um, but that's just what I got out of my conversation with Cynthia, and this group might decide to pursue it in a different way. Um, but I think overall she seemed, you know, for my conversation with Cynthia, it seemed like it would make sense for our group to make sure that's in place in one way or another, that the commitment to that sort of collaborative relationship building style and communication skills is embedded in that so that it has longevity. Um, and I guess that's it. And then the only thing I wanted to add, aside from what I got out of the conversation with Cynthia, is that, um, you know, she, she was clear to say, you know, negotiations would, would not take place in this sort of group, but this group could discuss issues that um, might come up in negotiations, gather information um, to provide to the negotiation table. And I was interested in that piece because I think my original um, desire to bring this up to this group came out of work we did in negotiations where there were these sort of lingering issues that we would have liked to have more time to talk about. Um, perhaps it's not necessarily, so, so this would be maybe a vehicle to have those conversations between administrative, administration and staff, some of those higher level issues that need more time to be collegially and collaboratively discussed, but not with a negotiations timeline. So um, I'd love for 
if we decide as a group that that, that sort of committee makes sense. I personally would advocate for um, you know, look, looking back at some of those issues that we tabled to see if there's a way to, um, you know, at least revisit them. Um, but there would, it doesn't sound like there's, unless both groups agree that there would be any sort of resolution or anything in that setting. So I guess that's a summary of what I got from talking with Cynthia and then injecting my own opinion <laughs> into the mix. Um, and I don't know if Aaron, you have any thoughts to add to what I shared. My email. We didn't. I just pretty much emailed Aaron and Jody, and we didn't converse about it. Because we're not encouraged to do so. Um, so yeah, that's always confusing for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about this? Um, and we don't have an action item on the agenda tonight, so we right. wouldn't really make right. be this making any kind of decision. So I guess maybe maybe this is a chance to talk about it a little bit. I'd love to get your thoughts, Patrick, on Cynthia's angle and concerns or um, mm -hmm. feelings you have about it. Um, okay, so. Relieved to a degree that a board member wouldn't be part of it because I think that has a lot of potential to, without intending to do so, um, kind of cross over from ends to means. Um, and when I think about formalizing the regular meetings that I have with the association leaders, um, that has pros and cons. Um, we happen to have a really, so right now there's only one. There's one co-president, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, as it stands. Um, they're in search of a replacement for Caleb Frank. Um, our relationship has, has been great. I think it's working well. Um, and I'm always open to different ways of doing things. I think um, it's more of a process concern I have than necessarily the outcome. Um, I think if this board, which it has authority to, to require me to create a committee to have those conversations, they're directing me in how to achieve the ends through means, which I think crosses a boundary in terms of policy governance. Um, if there was a problem with relationships in the organization right now, and the board said, we're, we are expecting you by, by emotion, we're telling you, make those relationships better, totally acceptable. And then it's my job my responsibility to figure out how to do that. Um, but to say how to do that, as directed by the board, I think, is probably out of out of alignment with the with policy governance. Can I add a little bit? Um, totally what was on my mind as well. <coughs> but back to how you ended, being beside you with the support staff um, negotiations along the way, thinking, oh my gosh, it would be great if we had another month to really unpack this a little bit more, or go back to schools and get some more feedback so we can really think about that a little more before we can come up with sort of a, a recommendation that might be aligned with our critical issues. Um, and we just didn't, and we put it, we have that, you have that nice laundry list. So my thinking was that what a great time in between negotiation seasons to start being able to collect some of that input and data, um, taking the contract sort of section by section and saying, is this really working? Is this working for you? Is it working for us? How do we know? So that when we go to the negotiations table again, we've already done a lot of that legwork. It's already there and we've done it collaboratively. That was my vision for yeah, the exactly. group. And to the point about um, what systems are already in place related to what Cynthia was describing, every school has a leadership team already. Every administrator has a, a team that they meet with on a regular basis to think about proposals and upcoming issues, and that's the team that they talk about um, budget concerns with along the way. And while we might be able to strengthen those in some of the buildings, uh, Christine always jokes that her whole staff is her leadership team. Because they're so, um, there are some improvements we could make, or when we become a district, should we be thinking about one sort of overarching leadership team comprised of support staff and teachers? I think that's something that we should definitely consider. Um, but to replicate or duplicate or try to tap on more people, mm -hmm. while we have a lot of those same people doing the strategic planning process right now, yeah. feels a little, th it would be thin, I think. Yeah. Do they have time, though, to take all these issues and unpack them, those leadership teams? Because it seems like they're already full, and we never get to these issues in between uh, the times that we negotiated. It's not like we've never thought about it before. I mean, every time we get done with the negotiation, I think we've thought, oh, we really need to revisit the entire contract and really walk through whether or not it's still working. So is it doable with the teams we have? I think from a 
If it's about data collection, yes. And, and even that, I think, when you move too far away from even just data collection, you begin to take positions about what the resolution might be. And then you are informally beginning to negotiate in a way. Even if it's not exchanged that way, like it's it, it just, there's a risk involved um, in not abiding by regulations around negotiating um, in the proper way. I think data collection, totally fine, and to agree this is information we need to look into. We need to collect this to understand the thing, the situation better, is acceptable. Um, as long as we we go into it with a common understanding about where that line is that we can't cross. Is, is there like so from a couple of different angles? One is. It's really hard for me to understand how we do negotiations without being involved with means. Like, I can't separate those. Like, I don't see how that works. I have an experience. I've been part of it. I don't understand how that separates at all. But um, certainly, on the laundry list, we could get a monitoring report that we could ask for one or something. We could ask for evidence that you've addressed the laundry list right and so then you could kind of show us that you've had some sort of meeting or conversation amongst yourselves and that those kind of things are sort of being worked through but then the, the board I don't preferably I hear that the board wouldn't be involved from probably from across the desk not it's not a spot for a board member but we could still ask to know that not to address whatever word you want to have that inf data gathering has happened in between negotiation times. That we could ask for that and still be within our roles and responsibilities, perhaps. So data collection is wonderful, but again, when we get to negotiations, not having some ideas of how we want to go about targeting it generally leaves us in a bind of how to get all that done during negotiations. And it depends on the team that's there. And if the team that's there has never received a sip, well, has not been as theoretically involved maybe as addressing how that data, what it means to the contract, because you have to apply it in some way, then that's a really rough time to start doing that and they get board kind of buy-in of how that would affect where our position lies. So is it out of source to think that then maybe it said what we need is a committee of maybe the people that are going to be on negotiations the next time that are going to receive this data along with the board and then take it into account in formulating how that data impacts the contract and maybe recommendations before we even start negotiations as to areas that maybe the most ripe for addressing in a particular year? Because normally we can only address a couple main issues. You can't rewrite, as we've so nicely learned, the whole contract at once. Um, because that seems like it would have to be the work of a board committee. And that doesn't seem outside of our bounds. I think now you're getting to an approach that's much cleaner. And it would be great to have any legal advice if there's any in the building about this. But, um, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if. If the approach was, if this committee said, if this if this board established a negotiations council or committee or whatever you wanted to call it, um, whose charge was but in, over the course of the next year to do the legwork behind some of those things that we did get accomplished and do, and you can, because then you can collect data as a group of, of board and administrators who work for you. Um, develop ideas about what do we want to target, how we're going to target it, what information do we need. You can start to formulate that um, going into the process. Um, and then there comes a point at which there's a formal invitation for the, the two parties to sit down together and talk about all the ideas they have about um, what to accomplish. That feels cleaner than a committee that dabbles in that kind of work a little bit, but isn't necessarily identified as a negotiations your informal meetings that you have, though, can 
you give that information to that committee as we go along so that they can be influenced by the things that you see coming or that are highlighted as issues without it still being a negotiation issue since it's only a one-way street of information because that would be helpful to that committee as well. Yeah, so there, so I mean already this year, so in October I'm going to have two side letters that I'm going to bring to the boards to sign that clear up some things that didn't get cleared up or we, maybe we thought were cleared up in the process, but now I'm trying to operationalize things that we realize are not so clear. So that kind of work and that back and forth with the union leaders happens pretty regularly where we identify, okay, this isn't really as clear as it needs to be, so we work together to draft side letters to offer that kind of clarity. Um, so we're routinely working through some of those things. And there are other things I note that like just don't make sense that we need to tackle next time, and I just make notes in my copy of the, um, of the contract that I could share on some sort of routine basis with this committee that you can factor in however it needs to factor in. I think that would be incredibly helpful for Sean. <coughs> so yeah, I think that was where I was starting and then in talking with Cynthia, it morphed to something different, but if we can get back to where we started, which kind of Katrina was speaking to also, and I wonder if, um, when we were at the table with the support staff group, you know, there were a couple of folks that said, if you dive into some of these issues in between, I would be willing to be part of that. And so is that something we could do to, to because one of the issues that we, you know, encountered in negotiations was, are we all coming with the same information from the same place at the same time? We might be able to get to that more easily ahead of the, some folks you know, from support staff or staff. I mean, I see how it could be beneficial. I just also see how it can be really risky and easy to cross that line. Um, the line of negotiation. Uh -huh. If you have, if you have sort of both sides yeah. represented in yeah. mutual data collection as you're working to solve a problem that you've collectively identified, how do you stop that process from understanding the problem to solving the problem? Because uh -huh. it's not a black and white line, it's a free gray line, mm -hmm. and that's risky. Um, so you would need a motion to direct you to do something, right? We no, can't do that. We so can't do it tonight. Right. right. We can't do it. We're not on a factor. But we can't also just suggest to you that you do something. We're not really allowed. No, we'd have to put it on for next, next month. month. Right. Right. But the conversation turned, took a turn somewhere that, so that I, don't, I don't think we can direct <laughs> Patrick to form a labor management. Right. We can't do that. But what it sounds like what we can do is establish who our negotiators are. And then, then they become our committee and task them with keeping up to date on um, where sort of the status of things. They're, that It's kind of what the negotiating did before. Before we started formally negotiating the back and forth, we got some background information that we used to form our decision when the time came. So this, in my mind, would just be a, a very early start at accumulating that background information we're going to need when we officially begin negotiation. So that then we wouldn't have to go and have all this backtrack <clears throat> and we would have the information Everybody has the information, and we would go from there. So how I would see it playing out in my perfect world would be we would develop a small committee of maybe three people uh, that would be tasked with being the primary negotiating team to work on negotiations from now until when we actually start negotiations. And what we would ask them to do is collaborate with the superintendent and admin staff for data collection on areas in the contract that we've identified as need more data collection, and then work to provide possible solutions. At the same time, we could, in fact, create some type of document that provides the data we collect in a meaningful way that then, as soon as we enter negotiations, we can actually provide to the other side. Because as soon as we officially invite them to participate, we can share information that could lead to negotiations with them. So then we do start with same information and in that they have all the information we have. And we can let them know what our intent is and how we plan to process. And then they can decide on their side whether or not they would like to 
mirror our ideas or not. We can't force them to. But if we came with all that information, I think we would be significantly ahead of the game in terms of having both data availability to provide the other side with the same information we have, ideas or recommendations, and a primary approach to the things that are most important to us to address. Chris, I mean, I think that's good and really helpful, but I don't think it fully addresses some of the things. I'd look into Katrina only to see what you think, because there were some other issues, and maybe we just can't do it um, outside of negotiations, but and maybe this next round will be even that much more efficient, having had such a better experience this last round. But there were some issues that were more, I think, needed conversation between the parties. And so that, I think, was the kind of thing that this group talked about. Wouldn't it be great if we could have some of that dialogue um, in the length of time that it might take that might be more luxurious than doing it in negotiations. Um, so I was just going to say, I'm not sure where that fits in. And then the other thing I was going to say is, um, or I was going to ask Patrick, when you meet with your with uh, association folks, um, is there an opportunity to have some of those conversations? I mean, I have no idea what the nature is. I, I'm assuming grievances is one of the things you guys talk about. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, I haven't had a single conversation. Yeah, excellent. So you're so. You know, it is, is it, I mean, would we, would that, I don't know, I just, I don't know what to do with some of those things, and maybe we can't do anything. Maybe we just wait, but there, there are things that data are, isn't necessarily going to help. I mean, a little bit maybe, but they're, they're, they're more really sort of policies around working environments and, you know, that's. I feel like those we're, are the we're kind of yeah. getting swirled into okay. some places that we don't need to mm -hmm. really go, right? So, I'll let well, you I, I just, I mean, I think that I want clarity so that I know what we're recommending. I don't um, think we are recommending. Right. What I'm hearing. Well, I, so some sense. of the things that were brought up aren't contract issues. That they're things that don't belong in a contract. Well, yes. some of them, they kind of bubbled up based on the negotiations and um, continuing the conversations and that kind of thing. So I think it would be advantageous to direct our committee that we have, not that we're doing that tonight, but direct the committee that we have to work with the people that were involved in the administration and however they want to put that group together on the laundry list that you came up with. Because you already know your collective issues, your critical issues that came up. So you don't want to reinvent the wheel and then figure out, you know, leave it to you all to figure out how to come up. Because it sounds like Katrina's already been thinking about it. You've been thinking about it. I mentioned there are other people who have been thinking about it too and it kind of sort of comes up. So just not give you the ingredient, you know, give you specific, specific things, but give you some latitude to, to work on the things that you wanted to. So two things. One is, as long as it's in the contract, whether or not it should be in there, we can't do it because it's technically part of the contract until it gets removed. And the other thing is that by getting all of this work done out of the way on our side, because we can't have some of these conversations with them until we're in negotiations, we do free up time in negotiations to have more conversations that are very pertinent about how to solve the problem rather than identifying the problem at the time. And I think that although it may not be a perfect approach, it's a good building block off of what we've started. And it may help once we've tried that to see if it alleviates the need to have, to have more time, to then be able to identify if there are ways to tweak it to be even more effective. And it may just be something that I think that we have to dabble in a little bit as we go, but be very careful, like Patrick said, not to reach the point where we negotiate, because if we do that, there are lots of big parties involved that are going to get really pissed really fast at us if we don't need that. And the ongoing conversation they're having right now is keeping that door, that goodwill that was established mm -hmm. going in a small way. So so I think that... I'd be curious to hear Emily's thoughts on this. 
I think if you change up your structure, you would have to get your attorney to look at your plan, which is what Patrick knew, I would say, because the law is very tight on negotiations. It doesn't let you get creative, unfortunately. That's just the way the law is. And um, one of the aspects of the law that I wanted to make sure you were remembering is that there are a lot of ways to get to be deemed as interfering in bargaining if you exchange information with employees outside of their elected representatives. So that's why, that's why I think systems have settled into the model that you use now. But I think, and I would even want to get confirmation on this, I think it's above board for this board to appoint a negotiations committee and for that committee to begin its work whenever it wants to. to and they're not talking to anybody. They're, just, they're not talking yeah, to anybody. It's right. just the board right. members. And they can receive information from you, and they can work with that collection for you. And yep. we can talk amongst ourselves about how we feel based on our prior experiences things might play out. When you start your homework leading up to negotiations, it's up to you to do And as soon as we invite them, then we can talk to them. And it, it's hard because I love the idea of like just hanging out, people getting together and working mm -hmm. through challenges. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of how we operate. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, there are regulations in the way in doing that about certain things. And and I think we have not that we negotiate different things, but the meetings that I have, um, which again I think since I don't have any authority in terms of what does or doesn't end up in a contract because it's between the board and the teachers union, it's not between the superintendent and the teachers union. When I'm working through um, sort of that labor management, some of those difficulties that pop up that nobody was able to foresee, we're ironing out some of those things and doing that work in a way that doesn't kind of cross the line in terms of negotiations. Um, and again, you'll see a couple of examples of that next time we, we meet in October about some side letters that offer some clarity that we have wrestled with already this year. And there's a lot of little things that we iron out and just um, oftentimes it's a matter of working through interpretations of the language in the contract. So we come to a common understanding and we then use that common understanding to resolve whatever issues either are happening or oftentimes the conversations we're having and the relationship we have is we're trying to get out ahead of something that we see could be a problem. I was thinking about with our RBO weekend getaway and how we were able to get away with board, administrator, teacher, support staff for three days like we did, but I can remember very clearly many, many times that they saying we're not negotiating. And moving us in a different direction. Like she, I think she was watching that really, really closely, mm -hmm. and I really hadn't appreciated that until this conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And absent a facilitator whose job is to watch for that and mm -hmm. call you on it when you cross the line, yeah. it's really hard to stick to what's acceptable. We didn't realize we were almost negotiating. We were just right. talking. We were just solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's not um, negotiating. It's we midnight. Just, we're just <laughs> trying to be finished. <laughs> <laughs> she won't let us out of here until we're done. Exactly. <laughs> I have just one example because I'm, I'm like, I feel so lost when I think, what could these issues be that are between the employees and their superintendent? Like, what is it between them and us that we can't talk about? I just can't, I can't even oh, imagine. It has nothing to do with what we can't talk about. It's just the idea that they're represented by a union, and we as a board have to represent the entire school district. And so if individuals start talking amongst themselves, they may not be representing everyone's interests. And so there's a very required way by the law that they have set up for us to negotiate contracts. And contracts include everything from the time of day people come to work, how many days they work, how much we contribute to their insurance, whether or not they can help assist uh, outside of their classroom activities and recess and stuff. Those are decisions that the school board makes. Seems like yes. complete yeah. means to me. It that is, is entirely it's the a process. And 23 other pages of things. Yes, 23 other pages. <laughs> but it is. You are right. It is, it is not, you're not thinking it wrong. Right. I don't it work is at just, the school. I don't know what time they should get there. Right. Maybe 8 o'clock is okay. Well, Maybe some That's five. why <laughs> we get advice. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and so although Patrick is being very modest in that he does not have any authority. He actually plays a large role in helping us understand his perspective of how things best work. So he oftentimes advises the school board when we start negotiating. What is working well for him? What is not? Where does he see problem areas where we're getting lots of grievances? Can they be adjusted by policy fixes in a contract? Is a contract outdated because we don't really do things that way? Or are we not using a chunk of the contract but it causes budgeting problems. For example, 
how we pay for continuing learning education credits or ways for people to get their masters. So it is really important to have in there because you're right, we wouldn't know what works best. But the authority to approve it has to lie with us because we're elected by all the people in the town that then basically pay for it to begin with. And that's why we also get to do the budget. So then that's a piece of our community engagement is yeah, oh, I mean, it's a whole nother topic for a whole nother <laughs> 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 Start small. Okay. Okay. Start small. That's another, another, <laughs> <laughs> I have another outrageous idea, and it, I think fits anyone's definition of outrageous, so I'll say that before I even put it out there. Is we'd have to check to see, <laughs> we'd have to check to make sure that it is, but I don't see why it wouldn't be, which doesn't mean that it isn't. Um, if we really wanted to engage in conversations with both sides as we work through some of these things we didn't get to work on last time, we could start negotiating whatever for our next That's agreement. Right. Is there a certain limit to how early you can start negotiating? Do of course you there is. your agreement, your first agreement for your unified board? This yeah, transcends that. It overlaps to win the... So the contract's written wow. in a way that it, satis it works for... And you, were, and you complied with the part of Act 46 that said with like within 45 days or whatever it is, you must begin negotiations for, you did that? Within 45 days. your deadline, yeah. I don't know that it's 45 days because right. I'm not looking at the I law. I have to look back into that. Okay. Um, as far as I know, we're not we'll out of compliance can, with anything. You can send me an email and we'll double check all the language that says at least by or that, that all the laws are written in a way that you could do it. That is not just outrageous, but slightly sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it could be, I mean, we're looking But if you really want to have those conversations with uh, the I just present, wanted to close the loop. We could probably just say, I have my well, list, I, 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 I put, put it you somewhere. somewhere. I think it would be was that, to be training yeah. Yeah. on, like, negotiations globally, like, that was like negotiating in a crisis situation where like you would have a strike, you know, it would be bad. And our advice was, and then the next week you should send a note to them inviting them to it. Uh, right, negotiate. let's get started. The sooner the better. Yeah. But there might have been special circumstances why that was. So if you'll let me look at my book tomorrow, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> More to follow. And you'll let me know if we're out of compliance so I don't need to no. say anything. I was just going to suggest maybe our little Yeah, we're going to move along. Yeah. 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 I don't think we need an executive session. Am I correct? <laughs> All right. Is there any public comment? <laughs> no public comment. Somebody has, nobody has the uh, board self-evaluation open. I, think I can open it very quickly. All right. If you will, open it very quickly. The quicker we, it is I open. think we still have our four questions. Here. Okay, I can do that. So the... So the first question is, what is the level of engagement of all board members? High, low, and then comments. So. Hi. I think we heard from everyone tonight. Even Barry spoke. Barry, soul plate, you're very funny. Any right. comments? <laughs> I'm marking high. All right. <laughs> all right. Are you there? You can take it from here. Uh, was the agenda followed? Yes. Yes. It was. With additions. <laughs> what went well with the meeting? We had a lovely budget training. Budget training. Respectful back and forth dialogue. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, what suggestions do you have for ways to improve future meetings? Sometimes you just do it's a big smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm it is what it is. Awesome. <laughs> I'll tell you if it's in DC. Can I just email this to you, Don? Or should I, do I don't know where it goes. Karen? I, I never it goes into it. so yeah. there's a login, I don't know. and we can redistribute the um, password and everything to get into it. 
but you can get in and you can look historically at your But does it automatically save, is what he's saying? Like, well, I, I, I only had a view only version of that particular one, so I just made a copy. So I'll okay. be able to send it. Just send it to the server. Is it not serving much? Oh, I'm feeling emotion. You are? And what would that motion be? To adjourn at 856. Alright, is there a second? Second. Alright. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any all right. If anyone feels so inclined, I brought a few extra copies of this flyer. So if you wanted to have a few on hand, I do. Nice so flyer. People are asking questions. I read it cover to cover. 